Thank you for joining our hearing today. Uh, this is a continuation of uh, our hearing from the other week, um, taking into consideration uh, Senate Resolution Number 393 on Futures Thinking and New Normal and the Future of Education in the New Normal. Um, we had resource persons last week from DepEd, TESDA, DICT, uh, from DAP, from PASOK, uh, from the uh, Rene Cayetano Science and Technology High School, uh, from PNU, and from Apisimi Development Innovation. Uh, so they were very helpful and uh, informative for me, and I hope for the others as well. And today are the, uh, we will um, take time to listen to the others who were on our initial list, but we ran out of time to listen to everyone. So we have more time today. And even for those who already spoke, I encourage you to um, stay on, especially for the government agencies, because the idea really is for us to learn from these other resource persons. Most of those who are speaking um, today are uh, not from agencies. They're either um, um, practitioners, education, uh, education ex uh, experts as well, but uh, not necessarily connected with DepEd or the other agencies. Uh, let me acknowledge the presence of uh, Senator Aini Marcos. Um, and yeah, so what we want to do today when we hear the other resource persons is looking at different perspectives and different um, techniques that uh, they have been using or they have recommended or they have observed in making uh, teaching more effective for students. Uh, taking special note of the changing times we have Please note that uh, the objective of these hearings is not just looking into the new normal, but really into the future. What do we expect to learn? I, I think I included in my opening statement um, in the first hearing uh, what I learned from, from just my readings and uh, um, listening to webinars, podcasts, and the like, that even in the U.S., uh, their math curriculum was criticized as being the curriculum from the turn of the century in the 1900s. So for me, I'm a little bit shocked because that's already the U.S. No, with, with all the resources that they have. Um, so what about in the Philippines? No, has our curriculum adopted? That's what I need to know because ch things are changing very fast. And how are we doing in terms of um, connecting uh, the different uh, education agencies with um, the jobs available in the future. I'd like to also hear discussions on that. And then I would also like to hear um, if we are actually able to look at the uh, data that we have, no? the, the learning analytics that are available. By this time, we have something. So are we able to assess uh, how many, where are the children on the learning curve? How many are left behind? How many are advanced? And how are we, meeting these different needs because um and please correct me if i'm wrong um i am of the view that most traditional schools including our public schools are still teaching in a in a typical fashion where um perhaps brought about by limited resources also um there's one lesson plan and there's 30 or 40 or 50 students but we already know that everybody all these kids have different learning abilities and different um rates of um comprehension and actually sometimes different modes of, of uh, understanding these lessons so how are we able to reach out to these different kids because otherwise without um without addressing these different uh learning styles these uh, different abilities these different intelligences uh, there will always be a significant number that are left behind. And that's what we don't want to happen. We want to be able to really give all these kids these opportunities. So on that note, um, I appreciate that uh, DepEd, as they've already spoken, though the ICT and TESDA are still here. The ACT, Lizanne, um, Perante, Kalina of DAT, DAT is also present. So, um, let us now proceed with the 
Can we add uh, the mic? I'll be calling on the next speaker. So can I ask everyone to turn off their mics? Okay, so um, we will first call on Dr. Aldrin Darilag, uh, Commissioner of uh, CHED. And to follow would be Dr. Napoleon Juanillo uh, from IRIS. So, um, Dr. Aldrin, Darilag, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Honorable Senator Pia Cayetano, Chairperson of the Committee on Sustainable Development Goals, Innovations, and Futures Thinking. Honorable Sen Senator Sherwin Gachalian, the Chair. Person of the, of the committee, esteemed senators of the Republic present today, and to my fellow resource persons, good afternoon to all of you. On behalf of our chairman, Dr. J. Prospero E. De Vera III, it is my humble honor to represent the Commission on Higher Education in today's meeting. Madam Chair, before I proceed, let, please let me personally thank you for your unwavering support to the sector of higher education, especially nowadays that our faculty and learners are battling the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic while transitioning to the new normal. Your foresight and diligence in the pursuit of development of the Philippine higher education is very evident and felt in both Senate Resolution Numbers 393 and 413, which are the overall objectives of this meeting. With that said, let me begin my report by providing a brief context to the pandemic's impact to humanity in general. For the world economy, the UN Department of Economics and Social Affairs, through its World Economic Situation and Prospects mid-2020 report, states that internationally, a 3.2% contraction is projected to hit the market, which would mean that $8.5 trillion will be lost as output over the next two years pushing 34 million people in, into extreme poverty. Meanwhile, the latest COVID-19 monitoring report of the International Labor Organization indicates that 94% of jobs equivalent to 2.7 billion workers are affected by lockdown measures, with 25 million of those are currently under threat of unemployment. Furthermore, the report highlighted that young workers are the major victims of both social and economic consequences of the pandemic, as they are disproportionately impacted by multiple and simultaneous shocks, such as the loss of jobs, disruption of training and education, and lack of new employment opportunities. Unsurprisingly, the education sector has not been spared from the havoc brought by the new disease. For the UNESCO COVID-19 Educational Disruption and Response Task Force, through its global monitoring report, it shows that as of June 6 of 2020, almost 1.2 billion young learners have been affected by school closures around the world, composing 64.4% of the total enrolled students across 134 countries. As to the particular statistics of our country during this pandemic, the report records that more than 28 million Filipino learners have taken a toll in their education with more than 3.5 million of those belonging to the higher education sector. Considering the underlying context mentioned, the Commission has identified the following specific challenges COVID-19 to the Philippine higher education sector. First, we have the decline in enrollment for the succeeding semester. Second, revenue losses for private higher education institutions. Hence, a foreseeable increase in tuition and other fees. Fourth, displacement of part-time and non-regular faculty. Fifth, connectivity concerns to faculty and students, especially the cost it entails. Sixth, preparedness of faculty and students to transition immediately to flexible learning modalities such as technology-mediated and blended modes of delivery. And seventh, 
disadvantaged stakeholders, and tertiary institutions. Now that one thing that COVID-19 has made possible in the academic community, and rarely, that, and rarely does it occur, is reaching a consensus that we are indeed entering a new normal. It is simply defined by the Oxford UK Dictionary as a previously unfamiliar or atypical situation that has become standard, usual, or expected. Hence, in pursuant to this unprecedented transition, one notable concept that you could all earnestly associate with the Commission is its full support and adoption of flexible learning as the novel and alternative modality of instruction under the new normal of Philippine higher education. Flexible learning is referred to as the design and delivery of programs, courses, and learning interventions that address learners' unique needs in terms of place, pace, process, and products of learning. It involves the use of digital and non-digital technology and covers both face-to-face -face or in-face learning and out-of-classroom learning modes of delivery or a combination of both. It ensures the continuity of inclusive and accessible education when the use of traditional modes of teaching is not feasible, not feasible as in the occurrence of national emergencies such as this COVID-19 pandemic. To realize a much needed and urgent shift to flexible learning, the following immediate response measures were immediately laid out and executed by the Commission as soon as the outbreak began. First is the constitution of a technical working group on flexible learning, or the TWGFL, tasked to, among others, assist CHED in the development of policies and guidelines governing the implementation of flexible learning under my supervision as Oversight Commissioner. Second, and the amendment of CHED Memorandum Number 72 Series of 2017, or the revised and expanded guidelines for the continuing professional education or RECPE, grants which secured funding for, among others, capacity building training of faculty in utilizing flexible learning modalities, developing open educational resources, and setting up online learning management systems and adoption of other education resources and technologies available for the utilization by our HEIs. Third is the establishment of a comprehensive online knowledge resource platform, which will house open educational resources and other academic materials for universal access by both our faculty and students. Fourth is the rolling up out of a massive training program for faculty members in migrating their pedagogical competency towards flexible learning and other technology-mediated delivery modes. And lastly, the constant dialogue and communication with the Department of Information and Communications Technology in crafting joint programs and policies to improve the quality and accessibility of internet connectivity of HEIs across the country. Moving forward, now that we are at a unique vantage point of defining what shall be the new normal, the Commission is committed in finding ways to make the Philippine higher education sector more <clears throat> responsive and relevant to the demands of our stakeholders. We aim to reimagine our policies regulations and standards, and plan for a rewired higher education ecosystem responsive to existing national priorities as well as the new global order. The silver lining in this is that the unprecedented developments affecting how we traditionally do things are providing us an opportunity to create a future where education is resilient to challenges, dynamic in the face of changes, equitable and inclusive, and holistically transformative towards sustainability. As such, let me present four major inputs from the offices of the Commission 
where the direction towards the future of higher education may be headed into in terms of programs and standards development for the trust of higher education programs and standards to the new normal there must now be a shift to a futuristic education where education is visualized to flourish amidst the ongoing adversity and that can only be done if it meets the following First is to become agile. This pertains to educational agility and being able to continually and rapidly learn and learn and relearn from various experiences and sources and to apply that learning in new and changing context, context to achieve desired results. It involves the division of learning tasks into short, simpler engagement and frequent reassessment and adaptation of plans towards the attainment of that objectives. Second is to become resilient person. This refers to academic resilience, which meant achieving good educational outcomes despite challenges and adversities. It involves strategic planning, development of relevant skills and detailed practice involving the whole academic community to help vulnerable stakeholders do better than their circumstances might have predicted. Third is inclusive. Coined as inclusive education, this means that all learners, no matter who they are, can learn together in the same institution. This entails reaching out to all learners and removing all barriers that could limit participation and achievement. The fourth is transformative. A transformative education is one that empowers learners to, to see the social world differently and through an ethical lens so that they will challenge and change the status quo as agents of change. In terms of international affairs staff, for our internationalization, the transnational education efforts now is an opportune time to redefine internationalization and international higher education cooperation to support health and economic recovery in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. We note that pursuing this route where we build equitable collaborations with and among higher education stakeholders does not only empower them to respond to the to sustainable development goals, it will also expand our contributions in addressing the country's SDG commitments. Here are some observations made on internationalization where action shall be placed. First is the reassessment of policies and guidelines to adapt the Education 4.0 trend under the new normal. The COVID-19 pandemic in many ways has also heightened the urgency of and proactiveness needed to take the fourth industrial revolution more seriously. Now that education will be more re reliant on utilizing technological means in achieving and delivering learning outcomes to our students, the corresponding policies and guidelines for such should no longer just be complementary or supplemental to the traditional in-person modality, but rather take a position that is central and key to the institutional objectives of, of our higher education sector. Second is maintaining international competence under the new normal. The 2020 Times Higher Education Asia Rankings was just released recently, and the two Philippine HEIs were able to make the cut the University of the Philippines jumped 30 ranks from its 2019 rankings by landing to the 65th spot for this year, the highest it has ever been. While the De La Salle University managed to remain in the top 500, but dropped to the 301st to 350th bracket from its 251st to 300th spot last year. Although it is expected that these ranking publications may, ha may have to adjust their parameters to represent the situation on the ground, 
the same treatment must be applied to our HEIs. Internationalization must remain integral so that the persistent exchange of ideas may eventually lead to discoveries invaluable to mankind, such as, if possible, a vaccine for the deadly disease. Now, the third is the strengthening transnational education program to attract more international students. As of 2019, there are 12,126 international students in the country in which majority of them are taking medical degree programs. These foreign students contribute not only to the international rankings of our HEIs, but also to the economy as part of student tourism. Hence, preserving such edge in the outright priority, pre preserving such edge is an outright priority. If travel restrictions are still in effect, hindering our international students to come here in the Philippines, then their degree programs can be transformed into transnational education programs, which can adapt flexible learning. All theoretical courses can be temporarily offered online, but for clerkship or internship for medical students shall be taken in country once the ban is lifted. Madam Chair, in terms of student development and services, it is without a doubt that our students are one of our most affected stakeholders by this pandemic. That is why the proactive response for student development and services should be to take into utmost consideration the well-being of our learners under these turbulent circumstances, while at the same time guaranteeing that education must go on unhampered. Hence, our HEIs must be cautious in maintaining the essential synergy between the noble education objectives of equity and quality for our learners. This could be attained by considering the following initiatives. Number one is flexible student affairs and services unit. Number two, emergency education response. And number three, purposive implementation of flexible learning. Let me shift to the last part of my sharing, thinking outside the box, uh, which is all about the regional consortiums of higher education systems. Madam Chair, if you would still allow me to, I have the honor to report as well to this August body, one of the key initiatives I have undertaken to realize the adequate and responsive transition towards the new normal for higher education. I refer to it as the establishment of regional consortiums of higher education institutions. Drawing inspiration from the economic phenomenon called the tragedy of the commons, my rationale for coming up with this proposal is to systematize and organize our HEIs in terms of their collective efforts to efficiently and effectively address challenges brought upon by the COVID-19 induced new normal. To date, I am currently supervising four regional consortiums, and they are from Bicol, Eastern Visayas, Northern Mindanao, and Davao. In an overview, the participating HEIs through their consortiums shall pursue the realization of the following objectives needed to continuously provide quality higher education to our learners. The Bicol Region Consortium of Higher Education Institutions, for this meeting, I would like to focus on the pioneer and largest consortium we have, Madam Chair, and that is the Flexible Learning Consortium of HEIs in the Bicol Region. To begin with, this consortium is composed of all the members of Bicol Foundation for Higher Education, the recognized regional association of all HEIs in the region composed of both public and private institutions with a breakdown of nine SOOCs, 23 LOOCs, 114 private HEIs, and 24 satellite campuses, totaling to 170 HEIs. My modest 
and humble appeal to the Senate is to provide us assistance in meeting the financial requirements to fully realize the objectives of the consortium. Since CHED funding does not include any capital outlay, we cannot include in our request the purchasing of ICT-related equipment outlay and a proprietary learning management system such as Brightspace and, or Blackboard. To end, Madam Chair, the Commission on Higher Education is one with you in all of your noble intent for the advancement of higher education in the country. Our doors are always open to this committee for any advice and assistance it may provide for the sake of our tertiary education stakeholders. Once again, Madam Chair and honorable members of the committee, thank you for listening keenly to the challenges and opportunities that await the Philippine higher education system as we journey towards the new normal. God bless you, Madam Chair and all members of the Senate. God bless the Commission on Higher Education. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Derilag. Um, I hope you will stay because I have questions, but I really would like uh, to be able to call on the other resource persons. And I'd also like uh, Ched no, to, I hope you also have some of your team members listening in because the idea really is the sharing of uh, ideas with all of them. So I'll, I'll reserve my questions for later. Um, Senator Tolentino has also joined us. I'd like to acknowledge his presence as well. Um, the Senator Tolentino or Senator Marcos want to say yes, ma'am. Yes, okay, so Senator Tolentino, take the floor, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, with the indulgence of Senators Marcos and the Chen Yan, uh, I thank the, the chair for giving that presentation, especially the, the, four, the four items uh, relative to the shift to uh, a different mode of delivering education, agility, resilience, inclusivity, and transformation. Madam Chair, th there was one bill that I filed which was not lodged in your committee, but I, I think in a different committee chaired by uh, either Senator Gachalian or Villanueva, establishing a tertiary online learning distance education under the Office of CHED. Hanggang ngayon, wala pa ho nito, Madam Chair. W what I'm saying is this. Uh, I've heard a lot of the new normal. I've heard a lot of uh, the blended uh, education system. And, and, and the presentation of uh, Chad likewise made mention of the of the tragedy of the commons, which I hope will not transpire because we have limited shared resources. Madam Chair, there has got to be a, a good explanation as to the difference between emergency remote teaching and online learning. The emergency remote teaching, which is being done in other countries like Japan, uh, has a, a specific time frame. Immediately after this pandemic, they shift to the face-to-face. -face. Now we're just focused on online. Madam Chair, if you will recall, during the uh, Committee of the Whole meeting, I reiterated, uh, and I think uh, Chair, Chairman uh, uh, Popoy de Vera responded uh, in, in a not so clear manner of my suggestion on cross-enrollments. Cross-enrollments would would equate to a student uh, based, if you, the records would show, a student based in Guimaras, studying uh, at a, a state college in Guimaras, earning credits for, for his stint in UP Los Baños, but being based in Guimaras without having to travel back to Laguna. And I, and I think the reply that I got was, uh, it's just relative to the UP educational system because they have several campuses Meron na ba hong nangyayari dito? If I ask the, the CHED representative, my, my proposal to, to involve cross-enrollments, uh, if you're a student from Cebu, you don't have to go back to, to Manila, just stay in Cebu, study in Cebu, and, and get your uh, credits while staying in, in, in your uh, peculiar locality. So that, that's my question, because the, the CHED representative mentioned a lot a lot of items uh, concerning uh, innovation. I, I will not be uh, belaboring all of this. So, may sagot ba doon sa tanong ko noon? And then, finally, Madam Chair, uh, minadali ko na po ito, wala naman pong kailangan baguhin dito eh. Uh, with me, I, I have here a catalog of nearly 3,000 learning innovations coming from uh, the Brookings Institute. 
and then uh, from a reference coming from uh, even the UN uh, Human Rights Commission, 600 distance learning solutions, especially dun sa mga refugees. So, so tingin ko po, walang mag kailangan idagdag o inventuhin tayo. There's even a website, Keep Learning Going, 300 plus digital learning solutions. So, back to, back to my questions. Ano pong tugon dun sa aking cross-enrollment proposals? Maraming salamat, Madam Chair. Uh, si ano um commissioner can you respond to that yeah yung with regard to that cross uh, uh, good afternoon uh senator francis tolentino uh good afternoon po sa sa inyong lahat so in terms of that cross enroll enrollment uh scheme uh i think we have uh a specific policy standards and guidelines for that uh, we are not uh, really allowing uh, cross enrollees. Uh, for example, a student who is uh, studying in Cebu would like to to enroll in other institutions. Uh, cross enrollment uh, has a certain parameters, no. So, uh, in terms of organizing that uh, that particular uh, arrangement. Uh, an, an HEI should be able to uh, to establish an arrangement with uh, with uh, a partner institution. So if, if that would be the case, there should be uh, a policy standards and guidelines for that. Uh, hindi po pinapayagan yung. But Madam Chair, uh, I think uh, I think uh, the 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 response was not uh, direct to the point. What I'm saying is this. Uh, cross enrollment between universities, especially during summer classes. The, the, we're not talking about about the old normal. So what I'm saying is this: I have a paper required by my uh, Agriculture 101 class from Upelos Banyos. Can it be checked by my prof the other professor based in Guimaras, also for the same Agriculture 101? So is, is this is this not part of what you just said? Being agile being resilient, being inclusive, being transformative. So this is part of the new normal. So, so siguro, it behoves a chair to have innovations, to adapt this. Forget about your parameters. Uh, we're now in, in a different environment. You, I, I doubt if you were listening during the Committee of the Whole uh, Proceedings. Ang sinasabi ko po nun, why don't we utilize existing institutions, whether private or public, Utilize even the professors. If I if I am a student, perhaps in Cavite uh, State University in Indang, dun po ako mag -go online rather than uh, go to Manila near my school in uh, Far Eastern University, for instance, or, or, or in Moraita. Kung talang ako sa sa Starbucks, dun ako mag -go online. Stay in stay in uh, uh, Indang, Cavite State University. Earn my credits there. Have that professor there supervise me have that uh, school uh, uh, have an oversight uh, jurisdiction over me, and at the same time earn credits. Can Chet do that? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, uh, we can do that, but uh, up to certain parameters, uh, Senator Tolentino, because uh, there is only an allowable number of units uh, that could be credited uh, or that could be uh, considered for this cross-enrollment. Uh, maybe we can we can uh, study on this, but uh, it is allowed, uh, provided that there are certain parameters to be followed. And I think, uh, for Madam example, Chair, I, think, I, I think the gentleman got me wrong again. It is not just cross enrollment; it is an inter-university partnership or collaboration, which is being done in other in other settings in other countries. So. It is, I, I referred this during the Committee of the Whole Meeting. There is now an ongoing collaboration between St. Louis University and another state university in Baguio. Nagtutulungan sila. Uh, kung walang laboratory dun sa isa, gagamitin ng isa. Given this pandemic, can't we do that? Uh, yes, hindi yes. Na, kailangan ba natin paluwasin yung galing ng buhol, pumunta ulit sa Maynila para mag-Starbucks lang mag-online? Iba pwede rin naman gawin yun sa Bohol, i-credit na, hindi naman cross-enrollment cross in terms of studying in Bohol, but use, utilize the facilities, utilize the Wi-Fi, uh, the Wi-Fi uh, 
infrastructure they have there, and even some professors, mag-check na rin ang papel doon. Can't we think of this modality given the ag agility concept that you have mentioned a while ago? Yan lang po, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Yes, uh, Sige, Commissioner, one, one quick response. Yes, that, that can be done. No? Uh, we can establish a partnership with, uh, with the different HEIs uh, in order for us to, uh, to establish a cooperation between, two, between these two HEIs. No? So, for example, the didactic part will be taken from one university and then the practicum aspect will be taken from another university. Uh, I think uh, it could be done provided that there would be a uh, a specific agreement that will exist between two institutions. Okay. Um, may I acknowledge uh, right now uh, the chair of uh, the Senate Committee on Basic Education, Senator Gachaliani, is with us. Um, but let me also make a quick reaction. Uh, thank you so much, Senator Tolentino, for your question. Commissioner, that is the whole purpose of uh, this hearing. Um, of the Committee on SDGs, Innovation and Futures Thinking. It's not the role of this committee to just um, hear your updates on uh, what's going on in CHED. No? Our specific target is the future. What is, our fu what is the future of education for these young people? That, fu that immediate future includes COVID, but we are also re looking at the long-term future. So um, what I can immediately conclude is with the recommendation of Senator Francis, uh, sabi nga niya, siya na nagsabi, meron ka nga dun dun sa recommendation mo, agility, di ba? And yet, lahat po nung um, sagot niyo sa kanya is uh, more on the negative side. I'm just, I'm just being candid with my appreciation. Sinabi niyo naman, pwede. Pwede naman, pero it's more like, ah, wala kaming ganyan. And then when he follows up, ah, pero pwede naman. Pero the whole point nga of this is that and kayo din nagbigay ng concept, out of the box thinking. So that's the whole purpose, no? We do away with what, what, our current, what our current practices are. We do away also with what, our, uh, what we know to be our limitations are. And we jump into a different paradigm. In that different paradigm, um, wala, ta, wala akong problema dun sa procedure that you are simply pointing out that there has to be an agreement. Wala tayong problema dun. But let's get it done. In other words, if Senator Tolentino did not mention it, do we assume na walang gano'n na mangyayari? Kasi ang sagot nyo was basically, wala tayong ganyan. Pero pwede naman. So that's the point. Yun nga yung gusto natin. Like, immediately now, we want to be able to hear na, yes, we will put that into place. Thank you. Uh, if you did not think of that one in particular, those are things we want to put into place. No, I know for a fact, uh, within a system nga, katulad ng UP, in place naman yun. So in that sense, lamang si UP, I'm assuming yung may mga ibang uh, maraming branches like uh, PUP also has uh, branches all over. Marami, marami namang mga state SUCs na meron. Siguro naman in place yung cross-enrollment sa kanila, di ba? Pero um, I'm jump-starting, I'm, be I'm thinking beyond COVID, what are these other partnerships that can be put into place so that our uh, young students from the far-flung areas who qualify, if there's a qualification for me, walang problema yon would be able to attain a, um, a uh, and dalawa lang yung nabanggit mong HEI na pasok dun sa world ranking eh. So, siguro, I can assume that may magagaling din in the, those areas and yet yung malapit sa kanila na SUC, eh, dun lang talaga sila. Hanggang dun lang sila. Wala silang means to go beyond. So, we take advantage of uh, COVID and uh, jumpstart this um, online education, jumpstart that partnership with the uh, key universities in Manila, in Metro Cebu, in, in the key area, so that these kids would get their exposure. That's why I didn't want to ask you yet, kasi ganun din yung thinking ko, hahaba tayo dyan. Can I just park that idea, and let's try to get back to it, if not at the end of this discussion, so we can hear the other resource persons, or later. And I really want to thank Senator Torrentino for bringing that, that up. Um, partner tayo dyan. I really want to push, no? what are these other uh, innovations that we need to think of immediately. Okay, Commissioner? Yes, so, yes. Yes, um, anyway, I'm happy naman na at the end, sabi mo naman pwede naman gawin. So, baka while, you're, while we're listening to the others, pwede nyo nang iniisip na how do we now jumpstart that? Ano yung mga colleges dyan na baka limited din yung resource persons nila and if not, if not even an official enrollment, 
um, because it's the mandate of UP as the National University of the Philippines. So I, unfortunately, I don't know if they're with us today. May I, may I ask the secretariat, no, let's include them for the third hearing. Baka they can have these open educations, no? parang webinars lang, no? to include, to improve the knowledge of the students. Dati, dati pa dati, dati, dati natin ginawa yan, pero hindi natin ginawa. So now, jumpstart na natin in the time of COVID, di ba? O paano yung mga young ones na in, in a dialogue I had with the SUCs, ang sabi nila sa akin, only, they estimate that only 30% will go back to school because even though free yung education, marami yung dala ng pangangailangan, wala nang panggasos ng anything else. Kahit na yung pagkain nila, yung konting pamasahe, wala. So only 30% that will go back to school. So ang akin nga, again, going back to UP, baka may webinar man lang silang mapanood. Di ba? Yung para kung hindi talaga sila mag enroll of course, gusto natin mag enroll sila, pero kung hindi, baka naman meron silang uh, um, ma-access ng mga free classes from prestigious universities and then matuto sila. So when they do enroll, lamang na sila. Things like that, no? But um, precisely, I invited a lot of other speakers so that we can also hear their ideas. It's not naman about me and my colleagues just sharing ours. I really want to hear from the experts. Okay, Commissioner, pa take note lang. So um, on that note, Senator Gachaliana, anytime you want to say something, just uh, feel free to um, um, take the floor. Uh, if not, I'll call on um, Dr. Napoleon Juanillo, uh, founder and convener, convener of Institute for Research, Innovation, and Scholarship. And after that, we will call on the Metro Bank parties that we invited. Um, after Juanillo, you can take the floor, please. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, Honorable Senators and esteemed resource persons. I represent the Institutes for Research, Innovation, and Scholarship. We're a private organization that basically advocates for building a robust research culture in the Philippines. You know, this uh, upheaval due to the pandemic, we've seen that never before have research and science-based science data have been more valuable to daily, in, uh, daily and informed decision-making in the Philippines. And so uh, with this, uh, last week, I think, we came up with uh, a few recommendations for consideration that in spite of this upheaval, one of the things that we wish the Senate to consider and through you, Senator Pia, is that for research to continue in our research universities. And so, in fact, we have come up as well with almost like a, a way to configure how the pandemic can in fact affect the way universities can put the agenda of the sustainable development goals so that they are much more salient, not just to the regions, but as well to the outcomes that we expect in the SDGs. But nonetheless, I think our, uh, our message is rather uh, succinct that in spite of the upheaval, research is very important. We need to continue to build that culture, as you very well know, you know, uh, we don't want people to be speculating a lot. We want them to have an appreciation on how the science works and how the process works. And that indeed, you know, there are so many uncertainties related to daily findings and that people have to be comfortable and have an appreciation for those uncertainties and for the dynamics of the scientific process. We believe that if there is such a culture among our people, perhaps it can lead to a better understanding on how government works and how government, government makes decisions every day based on changing information. Um, as such, um, just resonating a little bit with what Commissioner Derilek has said, we believe that building a common platform among universities and colleges, working on salient research agenda and topics, just so we can be much more efficient with the use of limited government resources in research, can be a, a way of boosting and basically uh, galvanizing a common agenda, whether in the regions or nationally. And so uh, one of the things that we did recommend last week was for government to establish a common and accessible platform for discussion, for collaboration and sharing among researchers uh, about their work in common pursuit of outcomes in SDGs, particularly now relating to, to health and livelihood. Um, and again, the other thing that we did recommend is that in light of the many reflections that we have about our experience in the SDGs, even if we do say 
let's go back to the basics, let's go back to whatever is new normal, considering that the new normal is actually going back to the basics, going back to uh, ensuring that we have food security, uh, better food production, better health systems. We say that the bedrock of all of this is really building an appreciation among the young about science, technology, engineering, agrofisheries, and mathematics, which we believe are the critical foundations of human capital necessary for uh, engagement in the 21st century global economy. And as such, also one of the things that we wish to recommend, and uh, there are of course other uh, concrete and specific ways to embody this in, in various, uh, I should say, agencies, but certainly there is a lot of uh, misperception among our youth that going into science, technology, engineering, agrofisheries, and mathematics are not lucrative careers. And so we say that to the extent that we can uh, ask them to take a look at, take a second look about the uh, lucrativeness uh, of, of, of these disciplines, particularly uh, on uh, STEM, that uh, they can actually lead to scientific and technology-based entrepreneurship locally and globally, and they can actually be much more agile, um, creative, and really building their own uh, building, uh, I mean, capitalizing on these disciplines to actually build little worlds, pockets of little worlds in the region, or even contribute nationally. So these are our uh, humble recommendations. We're not a government agency, certainly, but we do our share in basically uh, advising some universities on how to format their STEM programs and how to just make sure that all of this are not just, uh, um, you know, um, I should say, uh, what do you call this, uh, uh, you know, uh, university aspirations, but they have to be very, very salient mechanisms to be much more uh, meaningful to uh, communities. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Juanillo. Um, I don't have questions now, but uh, again, I'd ask, I'd like you to stay on so that we can have a um, free-flowing discussion after other speakers uh, see their piece. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let me now call on uh, our Metro Bank awardees. The first one would be uh, Professor Mercilita Handayan Labial uh, from Capitol University. Uh, her specialization is educational technology and teacher training on integrated technology in teaching 21st century learners. Um, please proceed, uh, Professor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and good afternoon to you and to all the centers here present and to everyone here. Uh, I will be speaking from the standpoint of a teacher who will facilitate continued learning during this time of pandemic. I am privileged to share with you my experiences with and expertise in blended learning and share the viability of this model for the future of education. It's been more than a decade now that I have used blended learning in my teaching and teacher training. I started using blended learning in 2009 with WebQuest approach as my model in blending my teaching. If you are wondering what WebQuest is, it is an inquiry-oriented lesson format which has six steps or six components in which most, if not all, the information that learners work with comes from the web. As it is, WebQuest is potent in scaffolding learning and flipping the classroom. I have flipped my classroom using WebQuest to enrich content delivery through Skype, Google Meet, Facebook Messenger Room, <laughs> with the advent of learning management systems, I use Edmodo and Google Classroom, where organizations of content or learning materials is made easy, assessment of students' learning is convenient, and where connections to community of experts and gamification of education are made possible. In this time of pandemic, my experience has proved that it is possible to continue learning despite distance. In Capital University Graduate School, for example, when the community quarantine was up, we continued our summer offerings and professors have used various platforms to deliver instructions and having the necessary technology and teacher training, both teachers and learners 
were able to get up and running almost immediately due to familiarization of both synchronous and asynchronous modes of learning. Based on my experience, all these technologies have increased learner agency, motivation, and participation. That is why, to me, blended learning is the ideal way to, the tr to uh, this new normal. This model leads students to the truth that knowledge requires a high degree of independence, flexibility, and willingness to learn that they can grow in knowledge even beyond the confines of the classroom. Blended learning also develops the skills in information technology that the world of work requires productively to, try to thrive in this modern world. In this time of crisis, blended learning can facilitate learning in a remote setting. But what it means really is preparation in technological and pedagogical terms. Technology is essential for the blended learning model, which entails stable internet connectivity and teacher training as two vital aspects in transitioning from the face-to-face -face learning to blended learning in this new normal. These two aspects, internet connectivity and teacher training, are what stakeholders need to look into and invest on, considering that even before pandemic, there was already a digital divide between the haves and the have-nots. During this crisis, that divide between those who can and those who cannot meet the new basic needs of the blended learning model is wider than ever. Not all households are prepared to move on to distance learning with devices and stable internet connection as necessary requirements to keep up with the learning modalities. However, the Department of Education has laid down multiple platforms or platform modalities to deliver education in order not to put learners in remote areas where internet connectivity is wanting to a disadvantaged position. The department has given options of delivering lessons via radio, TV, and print through modules for far-flung areas where connection is impossible. Institutions and organizations all over the world, all over the country, have laid down initiatives to address the gaps. For instance, in Cagayan de Oro and Misamis Oriental, they have tech of lock and modem to train teachers to prepare them for the extensive use of technology. That is blended learning or that this blended learning entails, while some districts have trained their teachers how to make modules for their students. Opting for distance learning or blended learning presents a unique set of challenges, such as modification of uh, curricula, training of teachers and students, addressing the technological gaps, and the implementation of new ways of doing things for an indeterminate period of time. Involvement in teacher training and capacitating teachers to deliver content in multimodalities is what I personally engage in during this time of preparation for the shift to the new normal in education. The network of outstanding teachers and educators and the Fulbright alumni where I belong have started doing their share in response to this crisis. Projects are underway on a national level and on a regional scope, which look into television modality and radio platform on the regional level that the network of outstanding teachers and educators are working, working on. Leveraging technology in this time of crisis is what my other organization is doing. Our organizations prospect or our aim really, uh, our projects are geared to help capacitate teachers and parents to facilitate the learning of their children to make their learners adapted to the new normal. So I understand that this is really very challenging uh, indeed uh, to have or to shift to other modalities in teaching during this time of crisis. But I sense that we are one in this critical reality of continuing learning despite this crisis. And blended learning is one of the ways we can move forward. I am positive that with blended learning, together we can weather the storm. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for that, Professor Labial. Um, may I, uh, I'll pose a very, very quick questions and then we'll just have a further discussion later on. No? But 
just to check, so you are currently involved in teacher training and you also mentioned parents. Do you actually train parents? That is uh, part of the plan, Madam Chair, uh, in the project that we are undertaking. Uh, part of the conversation of our organization is to include the training of teacher uh, parents who are who will be facilitating uh, the learning of their kids during this time of pandemic. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I say. Let's talk more about that because I think that's very essential, no? Yang training ng parents. Dahil I consider myself, um, siguro ako na yung pinaka-exposed, no? As far as parents goes for somebody who doesn't have an education background. Just because my mother is a teacher, so I grew up with that orientation and I, I used to go to her school. Uh, kumbaga playground ko yung school niya. But I know a lot of parents na nangangapa. So that's something I'd like to discuss further later on. Um, especially when you when you mention even a change of curriculum, no? Because what I am afraid of, and it continues to be a um, even again in the U.S. Ha, with all the resources, uh, highly criticized din yung um, supo yung ibang attempts attempts no to uh, go into blended learning. Because all all that was done da was replace the blackboard with a computer screen. And that is not blended learning, as, as you know, and as all the other practitioners of blended learning. You cannot just change the computer screen for that blackboard, diba? Right? It really requires different modalities, different approach. Um, I don't know, like in my case, nga, ang sasabihin ko, uh, in as much as I'm a, uh, I have a son who's 10 years old and uh, hyperactive, um, in a way, there, there are ways to reach out in the sense that, um, meron siyang mas opportunity to jump up and down for a few minutes in between shifting of classrooms. Kasi nandun lang siya sa kwarto, di ba? Hindi niya basta-basta magagawa yun in an ordinary classroom. So, I'd like to look at the benefits that this um, offers uh, a lot of children. But we'll talk about that more later. Um, I'm happy that you you are actually including parents in your teacher, in your trainings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. So, let me now call on... Um, Winona Diola, she is a Education Technology Coordinator of De La Salle, Santiago Sobel School. Her specialization is Education Technology, designing and conducting sessions for the Next Generation Blended Learning Program of De La Salle Sobel School. Ms. Diola. Hello. Okay. 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 DLZ implements the Next Generation Blended Learning Program where teachers adopt the blended learning approach and students from grade 5 to senior high school bring their mobile devices and use them as tool for learning. NXGBL is part of the school's curriculum that provides a transformative curriculum a blend of instruction which involves the seamless integ integration of um, face to face instruction and online learning geared toward creating an innovative, geared toward in, uh, creating an innovative learning environment where students are active, collaborative, constructive, authentic, and goal directed. Blended learning is a pedagogy that combines effective teaching strategies in the use of technology for effective and meaningful learning experiences. NXGBL, in, in NXGBL, we promote these four blended learning modalities, whole class blended, flipped classroom, station rotation, and the learning playlist. In the context of remote learning, DLSZ will highlight the use of learning playlists where teachers create well-designed modules that include offline or conventional or experiential learning, online asynchronous activities that will also promote collaboration and critical thinking, and synchronous sessions with students to provide timely feedback and assessment for learning. 
With learning playlists, we aim to provide flexible content and instructional tools that allow differentiated pace and path of learning and data-driven instruction. According to our broader president, according to our broader president, our school, um, our school uh, in the implementation of Pearl program in 2012, known as the Next Generation Blended Learning, the school has seven years of head start with online classes. The school has been awarded world-class certifications as an Apple Distinguished School and Microsoft Showcase School for trailblazing in the use of technology in the classroom. This recognition has given our school an edge uh, in the know-how in carrying out the continuity of learning plan. The one I'm showing you is the, the learning playlist, that, uh, the learning guide that we'll be giving to our students and teachers at the start of our uh, online distance learning. So these are the two certifications that we have received for the past five years now, Distinguished School and the Microsoft Showcase School. Then here, DLSD creates strong professional development programs on pedagogy and education technology for teachers, admin, and staff. We hold regular PD sessions resulting to a good number of teachers who earn their certifications from Apple, Google, and Microsoft. To date, we have more than 109 Apple teachers 160 Google certified educators, 19 Microsoft certified educators, and four Apple distinguished educators. Currently, we have a series of teaching training, uh, teacher training focusing on designing plans for ODL and updating our learning modules according to the DLZ curriculum data report. Uh, we also uh, um, train our teachers on doing instructional videos and um, additional platforms and online tools for holding synchronous and asynchronous instruction. We also give sessions on digital citizenship and data privacy. Then I have here, um, this is a Spark Ed Center to share our best practices for the implementation of the next generation blended learning program. We organize Spark Ed sessions or Spark Ed conferences. Brother Oka states that Spark Ed Center can further um, strengthen the educational initiatives and innovations to make learning more efficient, inclusive, relevant, and engaging for our students, and to be able to contribute to the advancement of the Philippine education. With seven years of experiences in the next generation blended learning, Brother Bernie is confident that our teachers in the school systems are ready to roll out the home-based online distance learning beginning this July 6, 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jola. Um, uh, just a um, fun fact, my two daughters graduated from uh, De La Salle Sobel, and my younger daughter is the first batch that uh, used an iPad when she was grade seven. Um, she's now 21 years old, graduating from college. So first batch pa siya. So I, if you saw me murmuring, I was like asking her, ano yung activities mo doon? Kasi I was very intrigued by a lot of things she were saying. And then she said, mom, we were the first batch. So I think nag-level up na yun ng todo-todo <laughs> compared to when they started. But um, the good thing is, and because this is the committee on SDG, they would do online quizzes. So doon pa lang, that was how many years ago. Um, Ano na sila? Uh, grade 7 pa yun eh. And fourth year college na siya. Uh, paperless, di ba? Which is part of our SDG course. Yes. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for sharing that. And again, we'll ask you, you more you. questions at the end. Thank you. Um, I'll pose a question now, but it doesn't really have to be answered now, no? just for my staff to also take note. Um, I'd like Dep Ed and uh, Ched to also tell us, um, what are these certification courses that uh, our public school teachers and professors are also availing of, no? Kasi I'm not really a believer of reinventing the wheel, eh, no? Kung meron namang magagaling na courses available out there, I do believe that we should take advantage of it. And then again, to innovate also, di ba? So it's always nice to see a combination of both because obviously those certifications that you mentioned, those are international standards, eh, no? Apple, Google. So um, maganda rin na we have 
uh, teachers who specialize in that. And then kung may local programs din tayo, okay din yun. Which is why I also posted the question in the Senate's official comments to the President's report. Um, when DICT said that they were training teachers, I just don't know kasi kung um, strength ng DICT yun na, na mag-train ng teachers. No? Kasi to make the technology available, definitely. Pero yung software no, yung modalities ba ng learning, medyo na-worry naman ako if that is under them. Kasi parang hindi. Um, kung e-expand natin yung scope man ng work nila because we should all work together, sabi nga, whole of government. Ang... Eh dapat meron tayong mga teacher specialists, including those who have just spoken, to work very closely with them. Kasi I don't think they have the capability of developing those programs. So yun lang, but again, post that, post lang muna and hold my thought there uh, as we call on the other speakers. So thank you for that, Ms. Diola. And I will now call on um, Mr. Rodel Sampang, uh, Principal 4 of Jeronimo Santiago Elementary School. Uh, his specialization is Blended Flexible Learning K-12 National Trainer and Curriculum Writer. And then to be ready lang, ang kasunod po dyan is Ms. Cancino. Okay, Mr. Sampang, please take the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and good afternoon po sa lahat. Uh, I will be sharing the learning continuity plan uh, or, and this uh, teacher's distance learning and development program of Apolinario, Element, Apolinario Mabini Elementary School. Kasi kakalipat ko lang po ng school last February. Uh, I will be also talking on a perspective as a public school principal. A COVID-19 pandemic has greatly affected the education system on the modalities in the teaching learning process or in providing quality education. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, DepEd and CR, the Division of City Schools Manila, and all elementary and high schools of Manila have adopted homeschooling through distance learning, blended learning, online learning, and flexible learning as our modalities each to be implemented based on the current situation as specified on our learning continuity plans. Distance learning with non-face-to-face -face modality will be implemented on the first two quarters of the school year, or it may be extended for the whole school year depending upon the situation. The lessons can be delivered by text-based messaging using messenger chat room or other chat rooms based on the LMS that the school will use. Video conferencing, webinars, and video lessons aired on television networks or videos on demand are also considered if and when there is already a vaccine and when it is already safe for the learners to go to school as recommended by IATF and DepEd have declared that face-to-face -face learning will be allowed. Blended learning, a combination of distance learning and face-to-face -face modality will be implemented using distance, using, wherein social distancing and minimum health standards will be strictly observed and implemented. Ma'am Jola, next slide, please. Class size will be reduced with a maximum of 20 learners per class, and learners will come to school once or twice a week for face-to-face -face learning, and the rest of the days will be homeschooling through distance learning, either online learning, and or modular lessons. For distance learning modality, learners with internet connectivity can access and accomplish the modules through, through online using the online, offline, online, and online framework using a learning management system. Learners without internet connectivity will be provided printed modular lessons or learning packets wherein parents will be the one to retrieve and return the learning packets in the school or barangay kiosk on their predetermined schedule. Parents will be oriented and trained on the use of the LMS and modules and how to teach their children. For teachers, capacity building, our teachers have started since April, the Apolinario Mabini Elementary School Teachers Distance Learning and Development using Google Classroom as our learning management system. Uh, blended and flexible learning was the modality used in the program. 
teachers are able to have hands-on learning or experience on the LMS at the same time working on modules on embracing inclusive education, which is a modular lesson for schools uh, from UNESCO. We will also start training our teachers on how to write modules and their outputs with the modules that they will use to their learners. Uh, with the learning and development, teachers' training becomes more personalized based on their needs and interests. Thus, different learning modalities will be used uh, for the teachers. Uh, as of now, DepEd Manila, uh, we have plans on the certification of teachers on to under Google Classroom. Uh, they will be undergoing training and they will be uh, they will receive their certification. Uh, for Manila Mayor Francisco Isco Moreno Domogoso will be also providing will be also providing tablets with 10 gig bandwidth every month to our students and laptops for our teachers, uh, which will they use for their own for their online learning. The challenges that learners, teachers, and school face are internet connectivity and the strength of the bandwidth, reproduction of modules and, distrib and distribution of learning packets, teachers needs to be trained in writing quality modules, parents and knowledge resource person must be oriented and trained on how to use the modules and teach their children. There are many challenges in the education system due to COVID-19 pandemic, but the Department of Education, the central office up to the schools, especially the teachers are doing their best to adapt and innovate to the new pandemic, to the new normal, to provide access to quality education to all learners. The support of all agencies, especially the Senate is valid in it. So that all challenges will be dealt with accordingly and the programs, projects, and activities will run smoothly for the best interest of our learners, parents, and all school personnel. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you for that, um, Mr. Sampang. Qu quick question lang. Uh, Nakapag-survey ba kayo sa Manila kung uh, ilang pamilya ang meron namang uh, uh, access sa internet or, or a cell phone? Would you know? Mr. Sampang, are you there? Oh, sige, impending lang natin yung question. Hello, na yun. I'm just, are you there? Yes, uh, yeah, yes, would you know, survey uh, na ba kayo kung ilang families or households ang may access to internet and then uh, uh, cell phone man lang? Yes, ma'am. Uh, gumawa na ma'am kami ng survey sa division namin, even sa DepEd, ma'am. Kasama na ma'am yun sa learning uh, learn, learners enrollment and survey form uh, kasama na po yung uh, about sa internet connectivity po ng mga bata uh, for our school po we conducted the survey last ano pa po ma'am uh, first week of uh, before the first week of May uh, nakuha na po namin yung data kung ilan po yung mga teachers namin na may uh, gadgets and internet connectivity for our teachers po, almost 90% of our teachers po, ma'am, uh, they have gadgets like uh, laptops at saka mga tablets. And meron din po, ma'am, silang internet connectivity. For our student, more than 70% have gadgets and internet connectivity po. And yun po, yun po yung isang basis po ng division po namin, wherein pinresent po ng superintendent namin uh, kay Mayor... Uh, Isko Moreno. Kaya po, uh, one of the project of Mayor Isko po now is to provide our learners po with tablets uh, with 10 gig uh, bandwidth for every month. Tapos po, ang mga teachers po bibigyan din po ng laptops. A question lang, when you say, when you say 70% of students have gadgets, does that, does that 70% include cell phone or 
hindi cellphone, we're talking tablets or laptops or desktops. Uh, halo na po ma'am yun, cellphone and tablet and laptops po. Halo okay. na po siya. Okay. Kaya ko lang naman naitanong, kasi siguro iba din yung delivery nung uh, um, cellphone lang kaysa sa tablet or laptop, di ba? Medyo limited yes, siguro yung kaya mo. Ako, nagbabasa ako sa telepono ko na ganito kalaki. Pero at some point, inililipat ko na sa sa tablet kasi <laughs> ma- maliit masyado, di ba? So, ay, yun lang, just to point that out, kung nag- magdi-differentiate din, or, or ang expectation nyo ba is kung ganun lang ang hawak nila, mabibigyan dapat yan ng tablet, ganun ba yon? Yes, ma'am. Yun po yung sa program po ngayon ni ni Mayor Isko, uh, lahat po ng bata sa Manila, bibigyan po ng isang tablet. Okay. Bawat bata. With, ano po yun, with 10 gig po na uh, bandwidth every month. Ang galing. Galing ni Mayor Isko. Okay. Maraming salamat sa'yo, uh, Mr. Sampang. So let's go now to uh, Regina Del Rosario Cancino. She is the Assistant Principal of Corpus Christi School. And her specialization is Full Child Learning, Formative Assessment, Flip Class, Flip Room, and Blended Learning. Um, after Ms. Cancino would be Dr. Hibanada. So Ms. Um, Cancino, please uh, take the floor. Thank you, uh, problem solvers, responsible communicators, and collaborators. Yes, this is possible through blended learning, blended learning specifically the use of project-based, problem-based learning, uh, and also gamification so that to address their uh, short attention span. I am, uh, no matter what modality you will choose in this time of COVID, whether it will be blended, uh, pure online, uh, modular, I believe it is the, it is the use of um, real life uh, situation that will really make your students or your children uh, problem solvers and critical thinkers. I would like to, uh, therefore, these two um, methods, no? uh, PBL and gamification, are the ones that I am proposing that the, the teachers will use. Now, what is project-based learning? Project-based learning is... I'm having problem with the uh, PowerPoint. Ah, uh, the PowerPoint, but it's not loading. Yes, yes. Uh, we, we are still looking for it, but uh, I'm just giving an ad lib. So, uh, we... I actually have... a. Uh, would you like a slide presentation, but uh, the PowerPoint is still being retrieved. Would you, like, would you like me to call on someone else first so we can fix the slides? Pwede naman. Oh, okay. Sige. Thank you. Oh, sige. Why don't I do that? No, I'll call on um, Dr. Rowena Raton Hibanada first, and then we'll check with you, ma'am, kung ready na kayo with your slides. Okay? Okay. Yes. So, Dr. Hibanada is the Director uh, of Community Partnership and Extension Office of PNU. Specialization is Teacher Education with Flexible Learning. Please proceed. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm um, to our distinguished uh, senators and to Madam Chair. We thank you for inviting us uh, to share our experience as uh, teachers and I for one is um, had uh, an experience in teaching at the public school and 
for 17 years and uh, have been advocating for the use of educational technology in teaching social science and uh, history. But uh, as now a practitioner in the higher education, I would like to share our experience during the past few years. So as we lived to the different levels of the community quarantine during the, uh, which started in March, uh, we, we were required to stay home. We all felt lost and somewhat confused, but the PNU during pre-COVID times have been used to a flexible learning modality because we already have uh, the PNU LMS, which is a Moodle, and the Google Classroom that we actually use in campus. So if the students, uh, every Wednesday, we have the flexible learning activity, and the students are used to uh, accessing the learning modality, which is the Moodle, and uh, all the activities are in place in our uh, learning management system. If they have a problem with connectivity, they just go to the school and access the Wi-Fi of the university, which is free for them. So we were ready in campus. However, shifting to full online class affected many of our students because of the problem of access, connectivity, and provision for laptops. Laptop. So we had to stop for a while. And thus, Maslow before Bloom is still the main consideration because we have uh, so, so many students uh, was stranded. They were stranded during the time of the ECQ. So they were not able to go back and the schools are closed. So we had to actually um, give support to their everyday needs. Uh, and we have to stop our full online class because of that uh, lack of access of our, some of our students. And that's what are the innovations that we have been making. The university have already university centers in place. We have the Center for Transformative Education, where before I became the director of the extension uh, programs, uh, uh, I was the head of this uh, center. We also have the Center for Science and Technology and Research, and also Center for Literacies. And these centers looks into free service as well as in-service teachers, those who are already in the service, whether public or private, to look into how teachers acquire transversal skills, such as their ICT knowledge, skills and values, global competencies, and uh, knowledge of SDGs. Also, uh, it looked upon spirituality intra and interpersonal skills and critical thinking and innovative skills. In our uh, latest research, which is funded uh, by CHED, it reported that teachers got the lowest score on global competencies and sustainable development goals, knowledge, skills, and values. And for the for this 2020, we looked upon the mapping of global competencies and SDGs into the K-12 curricula, which revealed a very low score of congruence also, meaning that uh, the, the competencies of teachers and also the the mapping of the global competencies that we want our students to, to have and to acquire is uh, has a very low congruence in our curricula. So this multi-literacy, peace education, 21st century skills are uh, somewhat being integrated into the teacher education curricula and teacher training instead of uh, looking into and uh, focusing more on the teacher training in the field, we prepare students in the pre-service education to have this multi-literacies of peace education, 21st century skills, which includes uh, SDGs, feature thinking, and uh, it is integrated in the teacher education curricula and the teacher training. So at the forefront, our uh, our domain, the University Relation and Advancement, designed and aired free teacher trainings on the social media so that we can address the gap of learning among pre-service and also the in-service teachers. So we just uh, a week after the community quarantine was announced, we established a PNU Talks webinars. And this is still running until now, five days a week, sharing different modalities of teachers and other topics to help teachers and parents as well. We also launched the online forum as a platform for teachers and stakeholders to discuss other issues confronting the educate, education sector. This is to fulfill our mission as the Center for Excellence in Teacher Education to be of service to our country's teachers. 
not just in the Philippines, but also teachers who uh, have become OFW and wanted wanting to go back here as teachers uh, and to be in re reintegrated in the Department of Education. And the personal note, just uh, just like Dr. Labial, uh, our alumni organization as a Fulbrighters uh, aired free webinars twice a week and served more than 20,000 teachers during the past weeks about the use of different modalities in teaching in the new normal. Uh, for our action plan, as a researcher and as a research university, I would like uh, I would like this community to help in strengthening the research capability of the universities, not just the Philippine Normal University, but also other uh, teaching uh, teacher training institutions to focus on how to humanize the digital pedagogy, the effectiveness of the different modalities of learning teachers and learners adapting to the new normal of education and how they can possess the competencies that are required in the future, such as the SDGs, the global competencies, and the futures thinking. Uh, right now, we have an ongoing dialogue about Anko Pedagogia. We look into how educators and how our DepEd um, curricula can be contextualized in such a way that the new normal cannot have a one-size-fits-all approach and how competencies can be mapped in such a way that students would not spend the whole day in front of the computer and how these competencies can be grouped together and mapped and so teachers can collaborate in terms of teaching the same competencies and for the students not to be uh, task on so much activities while they are learning at home. Uh, right now, uh, in the next uh, weeks, we will be spearheading a Tech Ayuda project. We call the Project Tanglao for university students, specifically at the Philippine Normal University, who do not have access to internet or any cell phone in, uh, just to continue the uh, learning continue their learning in the university come August. So we have uh, already the mapping of students who don't have any access to internet and gadgets per faculty. So we have a very good uh, data on this. And so uh, we'll ask and we'll knock at the doors of our, uh, maybe our mayor at, in Manila or our um, different organizations who can actually give a support to students who do not have any uh, gadget to use for uh, the teaching and learning or will, which will start in August. Also, we'd like to do more research on pre-service education on how to make our students uh, to become innovative designers as teachers. How can we make our students innovative designers and content creators of learning in modular, digital, or even in paper-based and capacitate them with the skills in digital pedagogies and to possess the characteristics of work-ready, disruptive, and resilient teachers. As our extension right now, we look forward to partnering with CHED as what we are really doing now and with other stakeholders on how education leaders can also use the future thinking framework and the design framework in establishing direction and capacities of schools in addressing the quality and accessibility of education in the new normal and ensuring that the school is flexible. The leaders, the, the education leaders are flexible in this VOCA world. I think that's all and thank you very much. Thank you for that, Dr. Hibanada. Um, let's now call back uh, Ms. Uh, Cancino. Uh, let's check if uh, her, her presentation is good, working. Okay, there you go. Please proceed. Mike, naka-mute. Can't hear you. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. okay. In response to the new normal education brought about by COVID-19, the educational sector, both the public and private schools, have explored different modalities in delivery of instructions. Now, 
I have here sample problems that can be assigned to students in this new normal using uh, project-based or problem-based learning. How can you make your house home safe and COVID-free? Isolation is one effect of lockdown. This can lead to a feeling of loneliness, helplessness, hopelessness, and even depression. What can you do so you will not feel or undergo these emotions? Lockdown has given families ample time to bond. Bonding activities, plan bonding activities with each member of the family. It can be pair, group, or an entire family affair. Make sure to include the date, time, activities, resources needed, and the location of the bonding activity. You may use a table or chart format. Lockdown can give you ample time on your hands. What can you do to use the time productively? List several alternative activity, activities. Choose one that you will explain in detail. The following questions may guide you. Why did you choose it? What will this activity require? The material resources that you will need and what skill or skills values will this activity develop in you? Lockdown can lead to scarcity of uh, vegetable and fruit supply. How can you have sustainable source of vegetables and fruits in this time of pandemic? So these are all uh, very relevant questions, real life questions that can be assigned to students if they work on project or problem-based learning. Project or problem-based learning is a multidisciplinary approach where the voice and choice of students matter. It integrates different disciplines by looking for commonalities or what they can work together, creating a seamless curriculum into one challenging activity. It can be short or long-term activity depending on the choice or chosen problem or project of the student. The students plan, implement, and evaluate it. The teachers are just moderators and the parents serve a support system. I would like to show to you the video of the grade three PBL public exhibit. A PBL ends with a public exhibit. And so this is this was done by the grade three. So these are parents asking the students about uh, their project. This PBL was actually a grade level PBL. Uh, all the grade three students did it at the same time. So it is a synchronous activity. Okay. So these are parents, they were invited to see what their students had done. So the students here have their plans and their project. Oh, they are at different stations. So this is a student that we have. Now this one is a great PPL visit uh, before the uh, these are the teachers who went to the and oh and this one is a sample write up made by a grade 6 student on her PBL and the topic is on childhood obes obesity and malnutrition this one was made by Candace de Mesilio, a grade six student of uh, six Rizal. And uh, she passed her paper to Chiara May Cancino, uh, my daughter, who is also a teacher. They started with the rubrics and the timeline so that they will be guided on uh, how to do it and they will be on task. The PBL starts with an entry event. They will, uh, the entry event can be a story, a video, a picture, 
or uh, an essay. And this one, they use an essay, okay? And then after that, then uh, they will formulate their uh, driving question, which will be their guide all throughout the uh, PBL. Here, they had a symposium, a prog program and signing of contract. The symposium included the uh, parents and it was uh, discussed with them why the student should have uh, the, the correct BMI. So they should not be obese, they should not be malnourished. Okay, so, and then uh, after the symposium, they, the children will have contract signing and these are the things that they uh, want to do or to happen. Uh, documentation is done. We have the before photos and anthropometric measurements. So here we see the child being measured. And then uh, documentation also included the health and balance uh, meal that he that she did. So this is the balanced meal for December 30 to January 5. And then January 27 to Feb 2, January 13 to 19. And uh, the PBL actually took them uh, four months to do. The, the document uh, tariffs included one week photos of meal plan. So these are the meal plan. after photos and anthropomorphic measurements. So here you have there the age, the weight, the height, and the different measurements. Then there is a comparison of the before and after. So this is the comparison of before and after. We can see here that uh, the child lost only uh, 1.6. Um, kilograms. Scheduled program, so we see here that uh, the program that happened after uh, their this was their public exhibit already. So they had an activity with the parents, they had yoga with Jericho Donga, Leo, and then they had CrossFit activities with Coach Aran and then family fitness day. And of course, there was an awarding and the biggest uh, gainer award was given to Va Anting Ting. Now, gamification. Gamification is the incorporation of gaming principles in the way we deliver education. It uses the principles of game, games. Uh, the principle of the story, the story should be creative, it should stimulate the natural desire of uh, the students to see what will happen next, okay? And then aesthetics, um, to enhance visuals and interactivity. Uh, game designers know that while it may, be, it may not be the most important factor in a successful game, how a game looks has a big impact on a player's interest. Uh, collecting things and drive to complete sets of common motivation for people. Uh, by giving them something to aim for and collect, you give players the ability to create their own goals. This makes them engage more in order to complete those sets. Collecting things satisfies all three core motivations. It gives a sense of competence and mastery in achieving the full set. Gradually add complexity to keep things interesting. So you start from the simple and then gradually introduce uh, complexity. Frequent feedback on progress. Let players know how they are doing. This is very important so that uh, they can see their progress and they are motivated to continue. Reward players often. Uh, rewards can be a desired task, 
a complete uh, an enhancement, a visual enhancement, and advancing to the of the game or the story, or maybe badges. Now, why gamification? We are dealing with five-second student generation, and the useful delivery of lessons will not do. Our students nowadays have a five-second attention span. What the students want is engagement. It is not enough what, that we do online education as a response to COVID virus. We need to do it effective, as effectively as possible. We start with evaluating our current students. A lot of educational leaders are clueless about the current state of our learning popu uh, population. Microsoft did an extensive study or an, on attention span of children nowadays, and the results are shocking. We now have students who have a five-second attention span. That only means that our lesson should have a stimuli every five seconds. Otherwise, the students will feel bored and will mentally lag out of the learning session. One mistake that educational publishing companies have was uh, when they migrated to digital is just to transfer all of their printed materials in digital form that could be seen online. Thinking that because it is in computers, then the children will engage. Our children are not spending uh, a lot of time in computers to study but to play. It is therefore needed to incorporate principles of games in, into an educational experience. Uh, teachers can work on or can use in the classroom, class craft. Uh, in class well, craft. In this video, I'll be introducing you to the classroom content button on the sidebar okay. and explaining how the section works. Then we have also quizzes. Uh, this is another uh, app where you can use for grading, for uh, remediation. If you want to have worksheets, this can also be for exit tickets and for differentiation. Quizzes helps teachers save time. Here's how it works. First, create a new quiz or mix and match millions of teacher created questions. Next, students play at their own pace. In class or at home, every learner competes to improve, and retakes are sent. While students play, quizzes handles the grading. Instantly, you see what each student has mastered. And then we have also Voki. <laughs> We believe that learning should be an enjoyable experience for every child. That educators are the sculptors of tomorrow's greatness. And with engagement, collaboration, and confidence, any lesson can be an adventure. Welcome to Voki. Voki is a powerful learning tool designed for the evolving 21st century classroom. With Voki, students and teachers alike can transform themselves into talking cartoon characters animals, or historical figures, just to name a few. Getting started with Voki couldn't be easier. Just choose your favorite character, hit the record button, and start speaking. What is 8 times 10? Voki also includes amazing tools to help teachers incorporate Voki avatars into class lessons with creativity and ease. With Presenter, teachers can create animated presentations that students will love. Voki's classroom tool makes it simple to manage your students' Voki assignments. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ma'am Cancino. That was very interesting. Tinake note ko nga yung mga apps na yan ng magamit ko sa anak ko. Thank you. Anyway, um, let me now call on. We only have uh, two more resource persons, and then we'll have uh, um, a question and answer for everyone. No? May question din si uh, Senator Tolentino noted ito. I will ask it later on after our last presenter. So um, let me call now on Dr. Peter Laurel. He's the president of uh, Lyceum of the Philippines University, Laguna and Batangas Campus. Uh, 
Hello, Senator. Uh, this is Wallen Tan, um, uh, Director of Game. Dr. Peter asked me to speak on his behalf. He just had to. Okay, okay sure. No problem. Go um, ahead. Is it us? How do I? I, I emailed slides uh, if, if it would be possible to uh, project it. Yeah. Um, or should I, I, I can just share it actually? It would be easier. Yeah, yeah. If you, if you can share it, go ahead. Okay, um, let me try to share. Um, so I'll share it on Office. One second, let me just get. Okay. <clears throat> So I'll just click share. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, can is is that uh, visible? Yep. Go okay, ahead. great. So, um, I'm Rex Wallentan. I'm a director at Gain. Uh, so we do a lot of research on kind of what what does industry need and uh, what what academe has to do to prepare for that future um but also at the same time i'm uh i'm the chief tech officer at, at southville so we're about six schools and i i handle all the tech and uh i i also have a master's degree in in ai so it, it, which may be useful to understand where where the future is going so we were asked to present a position paper. And we, while one thing that a lot of people looked at was actually um, what, you know, how, how to teach online or data analytics, what we're actually looking at is before doing all these things, um, how we have to actually master the basics. And one thing I shared in chat is there, there was a documentary done by uh, GMA7. They showed that in Metro Manila, there's a high school with a section of people who can't read or write, right? The section of kids, it's not even like one kid, uh, but a section of kids. So what, what our position paper is, is the internet drives much of today's business of, of learning and also of, of e-commerce. Uh, the best institutions in the world are providing their learning content for free. Harvard, Princeton, uh, Coursera, edX, and the millions of YouTube teachers are free. Most of this free, high quality learning is in English. Uh, just one thing to note that the best AI course in the world done by the founder of Coursera, and he was also the founder of Google Brain, his name's Andrew Nang, it's for free on Coursera. So the chance that any kid can actually read it, uh, have a teacher like that is small, but it's free on the internet. And, and what we want these slides to show is you can't actually see mother tongue or Tagalog here, but the world's content for free learning, largely the best learning and the most advanced learning is in English. And one thing with artificial intelligence is it's a very old field. It's actually been there since the 60s. We've known how to do neural nets since the 60s. But to, to date, I haven't seen a Tagalog textbook on AI after 50 years of, of the subject matter existing. So if kids don't understand English, they're locked out of kind of how to learn and also how to participate in the global economy. So we, we wrote the second half of, okay, the first half you need to know English to learn because all the learning will be in English. But the key employers, IBPAP and PMAP, they've always said, and for a long time since 1998, the number one reason why we're not getting kids hired is because really a lot of them struggle with communication skills. And that's always the first barrier of, of people getting hired. It's not like, even if, they have data analytics skills or AI skills. If they can't speak basic English, they don't make it past the first set of the interview. So while a lot of topics has been, how do we move to this kind of higher learning or, or mobile learning, uh, higher data analytics, AI, a lot of the basic things, just needing to know English so I can participate in the world 
these have to be done first, the basic skills of English and digital literacy. And COVID, what COVID showed is right now, you know, sometimes the economy will just grind to a halt, but not for everyone. We're seeing the new normal and there are 1.5 million Filipino freelancers who are working at home and participating in the global economy through the internet with just really two skills, digital literacy or technology and English skills. Um, the world is extremely flexible and we even have an example where there's a Filipino virtual team, actually lives five minutes from my house, uh, working for a Taiwanese company, handling orders in the U.S. through Amazon, all from their home. And what ha how did that happen today was really just digital skills and English skills, which are needed to participate in any future learning. It's going to be in English. And we know the world economy and internet will also be in English. So uh, going back to, to some sustainability, sustainable goals is these types of skills can even help reduce traffic, bring jobs out of Manila. And um, I think Davao City, Cagayan de Oro, and Iligan City, which are included in freelancer.com's top 20 cities, have are, are one of the hot spots for these freelancers. World governments and corporations are taking note, and they actually have mandated for common uh, digital standards right? and common digital standards and common English standards. So this goes to my uh, just this is just the summary of, of what I covered and I'll just we'll just end uh, where the Philippines is at today. So Internet drives e-commerce. It drives learning. It drives research and innovation um, and high quality free educational resources are available. So uh, personally, I took my master's in AI in one of, I think it was the best uh, university in, in, in Europe for, for AI. And I learned more from a free Coursera course, right? Like the a cost of like an Ivy League master's is prohibitive. It's like, you know, Ivy League right now is $40,000 a year. And I can say the Coursera course is just as good. <clears throat> um, and then we have, but if you don't speak English, you're forever locked out of the best learning in the world and, and, and the best and, and most of the internet in the world. You're going to be locked out if we're going to say, hey, I'm going to stick to my mother tongue because Japan is. They, they grew without English, but Japan and China are the number one consumers of English language learning in the world. OK, there are 1.5 million Filipino freelancers and most governments are saying, hey, these are the things we have to do. So a lot of them in over 80 countries, this is where GAIN does a lot of its research, uh, says uh, 80 countries are using a common English standard. It's like a United Nations standard. So we'll end with, with our last slide and, and so people understand what the data is telling us. And, you know, GAIN, we work with uh, a lot of high-tech employers, like IBPAP is super high-tech. But we keep talking about very basic skills over and over again. We don't say, hey, we're going to do data analytics. We're going to teach people AI. Because the thing with AI is there's only going to be three or four people who will develop the best self-driving car in the world, right? There's not a million AI jobs. There's just room for maybe a few, the best, the best of the best of the best. There's not a million AI jobs in the world. And the Philippines, in the future of AI, will probably still be strong based on the things that won't be automated like healthcare but to be great at healthcare you still need to speak english we're not going to have a million ai jobs but we're probably going to have a million healthcare workers who, who can go all around the world but this is some data so people can see the data we're always pointing to is that countries around the world thankfully are using common standards uh we were one organization that sponsored um uh, English research with with probably with ETS. ETS is the the organization that did PISA. So they they did PISA. They also do TOEFL, TOEIC, and SATs. So these these guys are they they're used by the U.S. Department of Education and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So we did a project with them. We sponsored, and uh, and the government didn't have to pay, 
But this is what we found. This is college students. So 50% of college graduating students tested at B1, which is the target of Malaysia grade 6, the target of Vietnam and Thailand for high school, and Japan is using B1 for their certified English taxi driver for the 2021 Olympics, no, not 2020. And then for the people who said, hey, what if your sample's biased? There was an Indian company called Aspiring Minds. Uh, they also have an English test. They paid for 60,000 themselves, also college students. And they said, hey, same thing, 50% are, are here. Uh, and again, B1, so two companies who did super large samples, a, a good sample, SWS does 1,000. SWS, when they do the voting, they do 1,000. This is one, we did 10,000. Aspiring Minds did 60,000. And they're both saying the same thing. Our college students have the same English level as what Malaysia sets for their grade six. So even if you see uh, the DepEd curriculum saying, hey, we're going to move towards robotics and AI and kind of all of these higher order skills, uh, what we've always been saying is those are great, but you ha we have to really make sure every child can are, can at least do the basic things of digital literacy and uh, English communication skills, which will open them up to the world. And the thing I always want to, to look at when when because one thing they said is uh, about the PISA study is maybe the test it was it was online or they didn't they weren't prepped it wasn't aligned. They weren't aligned with the right questions, or kids didn't know how to use the computer, or there were connectivity problems. I always like to point at this video. If you don't believe the data, just watch this video called Sa Sauyo High School, No English. And there's an entire section of high school kids who can't read or write in high school. I've, I've been in K-12 a long time. I haven't seen a, a one kid uh, in, in, you know, in, in our schools, we haven't seen one kid, one kid in 20 years who can't read and write in high school. We haven't seen one kid. But here in Metro Manila, you can see a section of kids just in a year, a section of kids who can't read or write. So does it make sense to focus on data analytics and artificial intelligence and mobile learning and all these high tech things when you have a section of kids who can't read or write, and also that where our college students are no longer as competitive in the global workforce just because they don't, they're not able to do, they're not able to speak English well. And for the people who disagree, the BPO industry, um, a lot of the low order work or the low level voice work was given to the Philippines, but they moved the high level work to Singapore at five times the price. And they moved, the, the number one for shared services is Malaysia. So because the, the transition of one of the biggest drivers of the Philippines to the BPO industry is moving to higher order skills, we also likewise need to make sure we have those minimum skills to compete. Um, so that's really it for our whole talk. We're just, uh, in summary, we're, all we're saying is focus on the basics because that's what will connect graduates to the world economy and uh me personally i think all curriculum will be obsolete by the time we teach it so we just have to teach kids learn how to learn and connect them to all the learning content which is the vast majority is in english and less than one percent will be in uh tagalog so that that's the the talk of gain uh thank you very much <clears throat> Thank you very much. That was very educational. Please stay on, no? So, because I have questions on uh, on your presentation, but we just have one more speaker, possibly two, if another one comes back, and then we'll ask our questions. So, let me now call on um, Dr. George Tison uh, from the uh, Center for Technology um, Science and Technology School in Taguig City. I think to talk about uh, their online, their preparation of their teachers for online. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Senator. Good afternoon to all the honorable members of the committee. And good afternoon, everyone. 
I requested Madam Senator the help of our uh, technical team to help me uh, use a slide I prepared uh, particularly uh, for the teachers training preparations in the city of Taguig. Uh, the city of Taguig is heading towards the direction of uh, making Taguig the city of technology and uh, education. And uh, of course, the city of technology, because as we all know, recently we were very fortunate to have our uh, robotics uh, cyber graduation with robots uh, shown all over the world, courtesy of our public school students uh, who made robots out of uh, recycled materials. And uh, now, uh, we are uh, looking uh, forward to make Taguig City the city of education by coming up with uh, several programs uh, in preparing our teachers and our students uh, together with the parents to uh, make sure that we are ready for the new normal. Particularly, Madam Senator, we have the TORCH program in the city of Taguig. If uh, our uh, uh, support staff could help me uh, upload or post the TORCH program. TORCH program is a, an initiative of uh, Mayor Lino Cayetano uh, that stands for Taguig Online Resources and Community Hub. It's an umbrella program of the city of Taguig uh, uh, for all its online program. Uh, as far as the Department of Education Taguig City is concerned, it involves two uh, specific program, namely the Cyber Lab at Home and the Tech Talk program. The Cyber Lab at Home is a training program for all our teachers. We train 4,500 of our public school teachers and 1,000 of our private school teachers in order to prepare them for the online uh, distance learning. Of course, we believe that uh, the new normal uh, uh, it, 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 it is a necessity uh, for our uh, teachers and uh, educators to have the proper training uh, for the distance learning uh, that we are going to adapt under the new normal. And, uh, because of that, we prepare a program that will train our public school teachers. No? Uh, it's a training for uh, all teachers concerning uh, basic Microsoft Office and presentation, which will be necessary in using and in teaching their students. And other than that, uh, we also have provided thousands of training for our teachers. And they were very glad to to, uh, and to announce, Madam uh, Senator, that in the city of Taguig, our public school teachers was able to finish more than 200 courses no, in one training during the period of lockdown in the city of Taguig. No? And uh, another program is the Tech Talk program for the training and enrichment courses from Taguig Online Campus. Now, this training is designed for our uh, non-teaching uh, I mean, non -teaching personnel and parents and all Taguig residents. So uh, uh, in the city of Taguig, we are training not only the teachers, but also the non-teaching personnel, as well as the parents who will be part of our uh, educational program uh, in the city. No? So uh, there are more than 250 courses available for, uh, for our uh, participants. And uh, so far, uh, we have uh, an enrollment of almost 3,000 composed of parents even uh, out-of-school youth who would like to take advantage of this opportunity, a uh, free training from the local government of Taguig. And of course, having said this, uh, having said this uh, Madam Senator, the city of Taguig is also conducting an education hour program shown every one o'clock uh, in the afternoon to uh, inform our parents and uh, uh, give them an idea how it will be during the new normal when the new school year opens. So every day we have a program, it's an internet and an online teaching program for preschool and for grade school. Uh, we're trying to uh, make our students familiar with the online training prior to the formal school opening. And of course, uh, as we prepare for the online distance learning modality that we're going to adopt in the city of Taguig, we are now uh, preparing the uh, learning and management system platform that's, that, that the teacher in the city of Taguig will be using. Of course, it's one thing if we, can pro if we will provide uh, computer, tablet, and devices to all our, te to our, our teachers and students, but it's another thing to train the teachers, the non-teaching personnel, the parents, and even make our students uh, aware and uh, familiar 
with the kind of modality that we are going to use come school year 2020-2021. So, uh, based on our initial survey, Madam uh, Senator, uh, during the online enrollment that uh, being conducted now all over the Philippines through the online uh, enrollment program of the Department of Education, we are now looking at the, at the number of students who will be our priority in the distribution of electronic and computer devices that we are going to buy to, to distribute as a necessity for the online distance learning. And of course, as far as the teachers is concerned, during our cyber lab at home training, uh, uh, we provided training for our teachers, but we're happy to find out that uh, a little less than 1% of the 4,500 public school teachers have no gadget or computer devices. So what we did for the uh, at least more than 20 teachers uh, who have no uh, computer devices is we lend our uh, computer in the public school under our uh, cyber lab program in the public school and they've been using our computer in the school. So uh, therefore, uh, Taguig City uh, is now in the process of making all the preparations uh, towards the uh, adoption of online distance learning and then gradually if the situation will allow us to move to blended learning. And uh, of course, we are doing things carefully slowly but surely ensuring that all our teachers, all our parents, and all our students are ready for the new normal and we are paving the way uh, for all the necessary and uh, all the devices and tools training that is needed in order to make sure that our education in the city of Taguig will remain a quality one. And uh, lastly, Madam Senator, uh, in the city of Taguig, we also provided a network through our FB group, a network of parents a network of teachers and a network of great schoolers to make sure that everybody has access to educators and to the office of the city education office in the city of Taguig. And uh, fortunately, the local government of Taguig, Mayor Lino Cayetano, has, in has installed more than 100 hotspots, internet hotspots in the city, composed of 28 barangays, to make sure that our students, our parents, will have access to our internet facility. So, uh, we're very glad uh, to inform uh, you, Madam uh, Chair, that uh, our public school students and our parents and teachers in the city of Taguig are all ready uh, for the online distance learning as we face the new normal in the Department of Education. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. George Pison. So, now I'm going to post the I'm going to read the question um, posed by Senator Tolentino. Uh, this is basically addressed to Ched, no? And then I'll be asking some other questions to the, the resource persons we have today. Sabi ni Senator Tolentino, will the tuition, fee, tuition fees be the same? Can Ched answer this relative to less operational expenses? We should not forget learning outcomes as well. This is a grand experiment indeed, God bless. So, pwede niyong sagutin, Commissioner Darilag? Uh, right now, uh, yes, Madam Chair, good afternoon. Uh, right now, we are uh, formulating uh, policies and guidelines for this. Uh, not only in the adjustment of the tuition fees, but also uh, for those institutions who are opting to increase the tuition, tuition fees, no? So we are actually uh, formulating policies and guidelines. But please take note, Madam Chair, that uh, uh, aside from that operational expenses, we have to also consider uh, some efforts that uh, the HEIs are doing right now in terms of module development, uh, the engagement of teachers and students in the learning management system, uh, the expenses of the institution in the flexible learning modalities, as well as some technological infrastructures uh, that would be required from the different HEIs in the proper implementation of flexible learning. I think uh, uh, mawalaman yung ibang operational expenses, pero meron po ding papalit na iba pa expenses for us to properly implement flexible learning. I think we have to consider those other items. No? Uh, and these are also the things that HEIs are considering right now. Uh, we made an inquiry sa isang HEI, private HEI, 
kung mababago daw mababago ba ang uh, pay ng faculty pag ang faculty ay nag-engage sa flexible learning as compared with the face to face ang sabi po nila there's no great difference between the 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 fees or the the honorarium that will be uh, given to the faculty members so maybe uh, we have to look uh, also in this uh, other uh, expenses that the HEIs could ano uh, could uh, could con could uh, consider in line with their implementation of flexible uh, learning uh, procedures. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just be propounding questions, but if you have any questions, just uh, let us know. And Senator I mean Marcos is also online. Um, so since uh, um, Commissioner Darilag uh, has the floor now, uh, I'll, I'll include my question. Uh, my question is actually um, connected no, with the presentation of uh, Mr. Walentan of Dean. Um, you mentioned earlier in your presentation, remember you, you commented on the importance of uh, having international students, no? Um, it, it, it increases also our uh, position because I guess having an international atmosphere is uh, counted in uh, determining uh, the ranking of schools. But um, other than ranking, it also gives a, uh, a good exposure to our students no? so that they are also outward looking to so know what's going on in other parts of the world and that they can uh, mingle and interact with these international students. My question is this. Um, it's connected to the English English language as a mode of teaching, um, and not, not just uh, by way of it being an international language of communication. The data that Mr. Walentan showed us is that 54 54% of the information available is in English. No, so um, I, I want to focus on what he said that he got a European education. If you want to get an Ivy League education, it could cost you up to forty thousand dollars. Uh, I don't even know if that's the highest. I think that's like media, no? Um, education. But you can actually learn a lot uh, from Coursera and online for free. So the conclusion being, if our youth, if our students do not have the ability to understand, uh, then they will not be able to maximize this um, available online material. So before I ask my question, um, I want to reiterate that I pointed that out uh, in a hearing, I think, um, conducted by Senator Wynne Gachalian uh, with uh, DepEd there, that um, please don't try. I mean, I have a different view from others, okay? I, I understand some would not agree with me, but I said, can we start showing a lot of cartoons and family-friendly materials on our government stations? Tapos somebody mentioned, ah, kasi idadab ba yan? Bakit ba kailangan idab? Eh, eh, a language is learned earliest at their youngest. No? At the earlier you're exposed to a language, the earlier you can pick it up. So this is just cartoons. No? This is for Saturday mornings. Why didn't any time of the day, if, you, if you're now going to use it as a um, skill training for the English language. So bakit ba kailangan ipilit, idab yan? Just play it in English. No? It's, it's cartoons. It's uh, just meant for them to... to hear it and of course choose the programs that are family friendly but to me that should be in English because it's the easiest way to learn to just hear it constantly every day pipilitin niyo pang idab yan that will take more time that will take more um, uh, resources it will cost us and yet you can just be playing the the thousands and millions of materials available online okay so that's one point I wanted to make um, for DepEd's attention the second point is in connection with CHED. Um, when you talk about international education, I am familiar with a policy in Portugal, and I think it's practiced in other European countries. They also want to um, attract uh, international students. And so the rule in the university is, uh, because they consider themselves multilingual also, their main language is Portuguese, but then uh, a lot of them, um, I, I, I've been there a number of times and they speak very good English, especially the younger generation. And they, a lot of them also speak Spanish. But the rule is, if you have an international student, you must conduct the class in English. Because obviously, how would you be attracting an international student market 
if you will not be conducting the class in English, di ba? And then papers can be submitted in whatever language the students are more comfortable with. So you also don't want to limit uh, a student who is more comfortable in their own vernacular, in their own uh, version of Fili their Filipino language, whether it's Bisaya, Bicolano, whatever. But um, you must be able to have a rule where you, you want to attract English-speaking students. What's the rule in English? So that's the question, my first question to Chet. Can, can I get an answer, um, Commissioner? Commissioner, yes, Ms. Uh, Madam Chair. Um, yes. Pardon for your, you know, for your question. Yeah, my question is: Is there a policy uh, for SUCs um, to follow when it comes to teaching in English? Because you mentioned that you are promoting more international students, and I mentioned that in Portugal uh, they are also doing the same thing. And the requirement is that you teach in English so that you will also be able to attract yes. these international students. Because why would you go there kung, kung ang, ang main language mo is, let's say you're from Southeast Asia, your main language is whatever it's spoken in your country, and then you can speak English. You definitely don't speak Portuguese. So my question is, how, do we have rules on that? Uh, Madam Chair, at the institutional level, uh, AGIs have their uh, policies and guidelines in terms of uh, uh, catering to the needs of international students. Uh, uh, more, more, more especially uh, in using English as the medium of instruction, but this is uh, institution-based. Uh, the HEI should also be complying with uh, policy standards and guidelines of CHED in line with their acceptance of uh, international stu uh, students. But uh, the primary concern here is they should be able to uh, cater to uh, the, the various needs of international students, particularly uh, the need of the international uh, students to to understand lectures and instructions based on English. So that that is really uh, being observed among the HEIs uh, all over the Philippines who are qualified to accept uh, international students, Madam Chair. Okay, um, Sigep, um, it's not. I, I want to emphasize that my concern is not so much to accommodate the the foreign students per se, but the benefit to our Filipino students no, to be able to interact with them uh, supports the need to have a lot of universities and colleges that are qualified to accept these international students yes. and therefore qualified also to be teaching in the English language. And yes. my second follow-up question to that is, um, is Ched aware of and uh, I, I know the answer to this, but I just want it on the record again for all the people who are listening to us. Um, I was in a conference with Ched on this topic, but I'd like you to also respond to this. Um, are, we, are we conscious of the reality that Mr. Wallentan mentioned about, number one, uh, the, a lot of materials that are available online for free or for a minimal cost are in English? And number two, are our students proficient enough in their English to be able to maximize their learning experience from these materials that are available online? And third, even if it were not online, whether they were to be studying in their own universities here in the Philippines, colleges, or they were to go abroad, whatever, are we cognizant of the reality that a lot of these jobs of the future which involve um, technologies are in English. And what are we doing about it? Uh, Madam Chair, we, we have uh, open educational resources and uh, these, are, these are available and, and these are being uh, written in English. Uh, we have these materials in order for us to uh, cater to the needs of our international uh, students. Uh, no, no, in, I'm, in, I'm, in no longer, of, I'm no longer asking about international students. I'm asking about the English proficiency of our students and their ability of our students, our Filipino students, and their ability to use the multitude of materials that are currently available online in English or in their schools using whether it's textbooks or whatever materials 
if we're talking about technology and other subject matters, they are in English. So are they proficient enough to maximize, uh, to use these materials and compete internationally? Compete meaning to say be at par yeah. with other, other uh, students from other countries. Commissioner? Yeah, I, I think um, they are not uh, not not the not all the students are proficient enough to uh, utilize existing materials. Uh, that's the reason why we have to capacitate still uh, our students in line with the utilization of uh, online educational resource. And we have also uh, need uh, to capacitate the students for them to utilize. Uh, Non, uh, non online educational resource materials like, like just like the module modules that are available um, i i can i can say that uh, not all students are proficient uh, that's the reason why we are exerting so much effort in order for our students to uh, capacitate them uh, but i don't really hear sorry uh, commissioner i don't i don't hear much discussion on the importance of mastering English language. I don't hear it. And so I was actually, um, I, I really want your reaction to the presentation of Mr. Tan, because it's important, no? I mean, are we skirting around this? Are we, are, do we not want it to be clear to the young people and their parents that proficiency in English will lead to, will lead to jobs? Do we disagree with those findings? Because if, if, if you're on board with this, then I want, to clearly see that those programs are part of the of are part of the curriculum and even with the teachers that they're also improving on their yeah. master english because how can they teach how can they yeah. even express themselves well if they don't because honestly all i hear about is mother tongue that's the truth that's all i hear mother tongue mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the reason why uh we have in the general education uh uh, subjects that are being taught in English. No? So we, so in lieu of internationalization of the curriculum uh, of the higher education institutions, uh, this is the main reason why uh, we we excluded uh, Filipino subjects because we want to train uh, our students in lieu of uh, internationalization requirements. So, so uh, the modification in the general education curriculum is actually uh, a good uh, initiative of CHED in order for uh, this CHED to push this uh, uh, internationalization initiatives uh, from the general education program up to uh, the professional subjects. Yes, I, 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 I suppose that there are initiatives uh, in CHED. Uh, because we are, we keep on e making some innovations. A very good example of this innovation is the GE courses uh, that were formulated by the technical panel in order for these uh, GE courses to align with international standards. Sige. Um, next, the next hearing that we'll have, kasi I want to focus on um, the jobs of the future and uh, have a discussion with our education experts on how aligned are we in training our young people in providing them with an education that will prepare them for the jobs of the future and i would also like to invite secretariat please note no uh, representatives from prc regarding um the the specifically regarding uh the exams because um a representative i believe from pnu last hearing mentioned that in as much as in PNU at least, um, they're trying to, they have been exposing their teachers to all these new modalities on more effective training tools. However, when it comes to the exam being given by PCR, uh, it's very different no? from, from what they know a teacher should be learning so that they can teach effectively. Yung exam, hindi naman yun ang tinatanong. So um, there's a big gap there. So that's what I want to talk about next next um next uh, hearing please take note of that no for our resource persons especially those in government um is deped around because i also want to ask that question kasi si mr ano nga wallace tan eh, hit it for me right on the spot na one of the easiest jobs 
for for Filipinos to avail of are are uh, those currently uh, currently available now uh, are is in the digital space and all you need is good in mastery of the English language and digital literacy. So may I ask DepEd, who's a representative from DepEd, are we conscious of this? Are we preparing our students for this? Because we jump to Ched, a college na yan, no? I, I'm learning Spanish, um, something I took up in the last almost 10 years. And I can converse and I can watch Korean telenovelas in Spanish, but I have to admit that I rewind quite often because um, di ko kagad-agad nakukuha. And I cannot imagine um, learning English that way and going to school that way. Na mayat mas mo sa teacher mo rewind, ma'am, rewind. Di ko nagets, di ko nagets. So my level, in other words, my level of proficiency in Spanish is far from my level of proficiency in English and Filipino, and that would not be an acceptable level for me uh, for students. Because hirap na hir I would be very, very uh, hard pressed to understand and to to um, learn if ganun lang yung level. So may I may I hear from um, DepEd? Sino bang representative natin? Meron ba? Earlier I was told that DepEd. Um, good afternoon. Yes. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Caetano. Um, I'm Sharon Monterola. I'm actually a consultant of the. Education Futures Unit of the Department of Education, okay. but I'm reading from the UP College of Education. Um, if uh, just to answer that question, but um, if we refer to the basic education exit assessment that was uh, last year, um, the that exit assessment is actually taken by all exiting senior high school students, and uh, the mean percentage score in the English uh, component of the test was just forty one percent. 41%. So it's uh, below 50%. So definitely, what, what's the goal? What's the goal ba? Uh, uh, that, that, that's the mean percentage score. If you have an exam of 100 and then uh, the, all the, uh, the, the mean of the, the test takers is just 41%, below 50, so below passing the, rate. What's the goal? Well, but do we only want to pass? I mean, for you, yeah, the, for actually you the, to enter, let me just ask the question mm -hmm. more specifically. For you mm -hmm. to enter college, or to choose a vocation that would allow you to to um, um, either get a job abroad or even locally, but but um, the jobs that are available in the future mm -hmm. that revolves around English. What do you think that percentage of passing should be? Is NASA seventy five, NASA um, ninety five? Actually, if you refer to the uh, grading system of the Department of Education, if you look at their transmutation table, then they're uh, they're just aiming for seventy five percent to uh, to say that it's a satisfactory. But of course, we want it to be higher. But uh, the reality is that the mean MPS is just forty one percent. The set, the passing rate really is seventy five percent in the Department of Education. But um, I'm probably uh, uh my my perspective is a bit limited but i'm because i'm really based in the university i'm just consulting for the education futures unit of the department of education probably uh josh uh here uh who's also representing the unit and is real, who's all, uh, also based in the unit can uh provide a better answer from uh, from our end thank you sure josh um madam senator um we are uh, confirming with our uh, curriculum and instruction and uh, for this moment, apologies for we cannot uh, provide the response, but we will submit a paper to your office, ma'am. No, actually, actually, we will have another hearing either, I will check with my team, no? either Thursday, Friday or next week. Um, so you can you can prepare it for that time because I really want, the problem with our, um, our, our setup, no? Uh, which is a trifocalization or trifocal setup is um, I always I always seem to discover that there is not as clear um, it's not very fluid no our our programs between DepEd and Shed so I have to go back and forth and find out that um, for these students to be prepared in college obviously the program has to start in English and what I'd like to know uh, whether it's um, from either of you later on or another representative from DepEd is because you have that futures thinking office, so you are now preparing for these jobs of the future, and we acknowledge that a big chunk of those jobs will require English proficiency. 
I always say you have, you have three choices, no? Ako pa nga, I say three choices kasi the top three languages of the world are English, Spanish, and Mandarin. So even if you say, ayoko ng English, o sige, mamili ka, Mandarin or Spanish. I mean, obviously, we have the foot, our foot in the door. Um, we have two feet in the door na man talaga when it comes to English. But we just have that divide. And sadly, it's an economic divide. Because um, those who can afford to go to private schools become very proficient in English. And I actually call it the... Um, I call it the Disney Channel or the Nickelodeon Channel English, no? Because um, anyone who invests in a, uh, what do you call this, cable, cable TV, uh, their children will be, will be exposed to this kind of English. And unlike, unlike sadly, the English, uh, the very good programs, including mga Animal Planet, which are dubbed in Filipino. And I want to bring this to the attention of that, Ed. Is that something that you can now talk to um, um, the TV networks today? Because... Um, if it's going to be for for learning pleasure, no, hindi naman yan strict academics eh. Why not, why not expose them to that in English while they're young, and they'll pick it up, they'll pick it up regular, they'll pick it up naturally. So, but you'll have to you'll have to convince the networks that you support this because they shift to Filipino uh, on the assumption that most would speak Filipino, which is not really true because if you go to the provinces, the Cebuanos prefer to speak Cebuano rather than Tagalog, and the Ilongos would rather speak um, Iligaynon rather than Tagalog. So, I don't know Madam what... Chair? I, yes. Madam Chair, uh, Jenny Hoxson of PNU. Good yes, afternoon, please. Madam Chair. Hi. I'm sorry for, uh, for interrupting. Uh, I'm, okay. I was listening to uh, your uh, discourse on English being a natural course of, uh, of uh, language for the Filipinos. Madam Chair, I'd like to remind uh, the committee and uh, everybody in the group that we have the mother tongue law in the Philippines. And the uh, mother tongue law specifically is, is um, grounded on the theory that language is learned, the second language, which is English for most of us, is learned as a second approach to uh, the sociological paradigm of life. Meaning, you begin with the mother tongue, you embrace the mother tongue, Madam Chair, you ensure that the mother tongue is learned not just by a language component, but by the thinking process. We think in our language. And the second language, according to theories and experts of, of, of language, Madam Chair, is learned well. The reason why English is not learned well in the Philippines, Madam Chair, is because our curriculum is focused on the use of language, which is not um, practical, which is not regular, which is at some point, Madam Chair, not usual. For example, you go to the market and you don't use English. And language must be a language of life. It must be a language of use. I agree with you, Madam Chair, on your context of um, listening to the language and, and the television in our research has proven to be a viable, um, a viable source of learning the language, even our um, OFWs who are abroad would learn the language abroad via via television. But that is only true, Madam Chair, if there's a big, complete understanding of the mother tongue. If we are, if we're able to ensure that our young people are learn the mother tongue appropriately from house to the school so that they can use it as a language of their lives. Unfortunately, Madam Chair, uh, the mother tongue law was not used appropriately in uh, the basic education it's not taught according to the expectation of the of the law it's not taught according to how it should be taught uh it, it it's not in the in the curriculum of the of the department of education in terms of what the law expects it to it it, it to be done so uh it's a personal call on my end uh, madam chair I'm, I'm 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 from pnu but the but my background is really on language and literature and and we begin with that we begin on the language language of mother tongue before we go into the second language um, secondly, Madam Chair, I'll take this opportunity. Thank you for mentioning that um, we need to talk to PRC in order to move things around. The problem, Madam Chair, PNU has been NCTE for quite a while right now, and we've been and we've been trying real hard to put everybody into the context of, of uh, pre-service teacher education. I see um, I see a message in the in the in the chat that says. Uh, in Australia, the pre-service teachers are chosen, Madam Chair. It's not, in the Philippines, it's just 
a last resort, a, a sort of a last recourse for for students who do not have anything to go beyond no? in, in terms of, of uh, taking a career. Uh, we have to shift that paradigm. We have to ensure that teacher quality comes into the discourse, comes into the, into the context of talking about all of these things about education. We have to ensure that um, in the logic of, of understanding where the Philippines is going in terms of education, we don't forget teacher quality there. And our experience at PNU, Madam Chair, as the National Center for Teacher Education is that there is no one, no one who understands the pure logic of where we put uh, teacher education from pre-service to in-service. Currently, Madam Chair, there is something in the law, which is the Teacher Education Council, which um, uh, Commissioner Derilag also sits in as a, as a regular member. It was a product, Madam Chair, of the long study of ensuring that education is linked between basic education and the tertiary education and prc in the teacher education council madam chair prc sits there ncca sits there dep ed is the is the uh, default chair ched sits there um and uh, I, i'm not sure about all the other and and pnus ncte will be sitting there as a permanent member um the tec while it is good on paper, Madam Chair, is not functioning according to expectations because it does not have that kind of support from all of the all of the members, including TESTA. So I, I think, Madam Chair, from the PNU's perspective, we're not starting from zero. We're just ensuring that all of these links are happening. And we thank your you and we thank your committee for uh, taking the time to look into all of this scenario for, for teacher education. But PNU maintains that unless we sit together to ensure that that Ed, Ched, at, at long range, TESDA and PRC sit together to ensure that there's a link between all of what we do. Uh, we will not move forward in terms of quality and all of these things that you want to be achieved, like English, ensuring that there's internationalization, there's a system to link our uh, context of the tertiary to the internationalization. All of these things, Madam Chair, will not push through if teacher quality will be left behind in the discourse of, of running the features thinking of education. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, and uh, I will consult with the uh, chairs of uh, the other committees. Senator Gachalian is here with us. Senator uh, Villanueva chairs the other committee. Um, so that's why it, it, the other committee is a uh, higher ed in TESDA. And just like the agencies, uh, committee, which um, was not something I was happy about. But um, I'll consult with them so that we can have joint hearings then. And, and uh, maybe in the next few months, I'd really like to find solutions for this no? because I, 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 really, I really see it also. Eh? So thanks for identifying that. And um, like I said, the discussion on the future, um, the job opportunities, we'll save that for next week also in, a week, uh, in the next hearing. Um, I'd like to invite more resource persons to, to discuss that with us. But suffice it to say, um, um, I think everybody agrees, even though uh, you pointed out um, the importance of the mother tongue. I have nothing against the mother tongue. I'm just saying that I've seen a shift between the English proficiencies of uh, the generation of my parents uh, to my generation, to the younger generation. And that was simply because uh, we, there, was, there were political decisions made. And um, and that shift happened, and and I'm not happy about it because uh, it 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 uh, with the effect of which um, just by looking at the data, the English proficiency of our college students are the same as Malaysian grade six students as Japan taxi drivers. Um, nakakahiya, nakakaawa tayo when when uh, that is uh, I don't know if if do we say that uh, we will we is this the beginning of the end of our um, our dominating the BPO market, no, because uh, we dominate it because of our English proficiency. So those are discussions I want to have, but we can save that for later. I'd like to focus now on um, on uh, the input of our um, resource persons, basically on uh, blended learning, on uh, using technology and uh, digital um, digital means, no, of uh, teaching our kids. Um. I do know that um, this is more directed for DepEd, no? um, but Ched also. I do know that uh, there have been talks about smaller, um, allowing physical presence in the classroom 
uh, that might have to be de decided geographically and obviously the time of that, I, I do not know. Um, but at some point, um, there may be areas in the Philippines where there is zero record of COVID, uh, but, but we would still want to um, practice uh, social distancing, that there really might be blended learning in terms of um, um, minimal classroom presence, but still classroom presence of like 20 or 30% of the students. And so I want to ask DepEd and CHED, are you also preparing for this? Because all the discussions have been online because that is the assumption that most, if not all, because possibly all, will be online or delivery of the materials. But like I said, in, in far-flung areas, I've been, to, um, I've been to areas in the north where uh, it's in, inaccessible by vehicle. Um, you have to walk two hours uh, to get to that um, barangay. And I, doubt, I, I would like to believe, I don't know, if there's any COVID in that area, and they're quite isolated. The school is right there, surrounded by the homes of the villagers. Um, if they will be allowed to have classroom presence, then are the are are we also prepared for for doing that? Like you know, 20, 30 percent papasok. I just want to know because that the point of here is futures thinking. Eh, but are we preparing for that possibility where there will be some kind of interaction also? DepEd and Shed, please. Madam Chair, uh, this is Josh from DepEd. Yes. Uh, um, uh, in the preparation of our uh, basic education uh, learning continuity plan, we have also uh, set aside the scenario wherein uh, there in places uh, that face-to-face uh, -face classes could continue. We will be able to limit the class size of uh, the uh, classes uh, to 20 uh, at the, to an average of 20 uh, students per class. Um, but uh, right now, the, the LCP is being contextualized in the regions, and uh, we are also awaiting the recommendations of our regional directors on uh, the class size for those areas which are not really that affected by COVID. 20. And that is for a classroom that was built for what, 30? Or forty. Uh, uh, if it's uh, the constructed classroom under the school building program, it's uh, uh it's uh, well, there are schools that fit in forty students in that uh, class. So, uh, but uh, I I missed the point that uh, uh, we will have face to face learning with a minimal class size, and with the required the implementation of the required health standards set by DOH, the IATF, and DepEd. Yeah, I think it would be, I, I just wanted to point that out because given that um, classrooms that, that uh, we have were built throughout decades, iba-iba na yung standard classroom size, di ba? Ang alam ko yung bang, at some point I knew it was very small. I don't know if it's gotten bigger. So my point is, it's hard for you to fix a number like 20 kasi okay yun dun sa Gabal dun school na ang laki-laki. Di ba yung 20 na yun, baka kakalug-kalug sila dun, sobrang safe pa rin sila. But for the small classrooms, 20, baka wala pang one meter yung distance noon. So I just want to tell you to be careful lang with, um, with, the, uh, with the details of the implementation because to set a number might not be, might not be safe because the classroom size itself, the classroom, the, the physical uh, size of the classroom, the building uh, may be different. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, the, actually, the Office of the Administration has uh, set that uh, uh, class size for new classrooms with a dimension of 7 meters by 9 meters. For smaller classrooms, uh, definitely uh, we will have a, a recommendation that is uh, for fewer uh, class learners. Okay. Um, so, DepEd again, um, what, what uh, I, I, I've heard a lot about the training that our teachers are undergoing. And uh, after having listened to our MetroBank awardees, a lot of the teachers that we called on today were MetroBank awardees. May I know um, if that, if what is being taught um, to the DepEd teachers now are aligned and similar to what I just heard? Ikaw din ba, Josh, ang sasagot nun? Um, I, I don't have the information for now, ma'am, but uh, we will uh, prepare a response for that and submit to the committee. Sige, please. Kasi the, the 
the tools, the modalities that they showed were very interesting. It was really forward thinking. Um, they they do address. I feel that they address closer uh, the need of individual students and that the individual needs of students as opposed to a general approach. And that is what I'm trying to go back to. No, even even before COVID, countries around the world. Uh, some like the Scandinavian countries have already addressed that. No, they they make learning very fun. Their classroom sizes are small. Their teachers are extremely competent. Um, parents are involved and whatever they use blended learning. Um, so they've been able to achieve this. Not to to um, I think spread out that that curve. No, from slow learners to to fast learners. Pero like I said, the critique that I read about the U.S. and U.S. Nayan with all their resources. Voila, it's still it's still the same. They're, they're not able to, to address the needs of the slower learners because they have not successfully integrated uh, these individualized approaches. So my, my point is um, I'd like to ensure, and not even try, but to ensure that as our teachers are forced to learn all these new things, it's not going to shift from Blackboard to a computer computer or a tablet it's really a change in the delivery and i don't know well according to our resource person they've been teaching this naman post graduate naman ng mga teachers nila no and pnu told us before that this is how they teach their teachers but now it's going to be a crash course for everyone else so um that's my concern i want to assure i want to be assured that um we're making the most out of this and and uh, like binanggit nga ni Dr. George Tison in Taguig City, uh, as we speak, the teachers are being trained, the parents are being trained. So do we have a way, because I've heard it said in, in hearings, no, but do we have a way of really tracking what's going on in the different regions? Would you be, would somebody be able to present that siguro by next week para alam talaga natin what's going on? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, but by Ted will be. Ganito, pero di natin alam kung tinuturo na ba talaga. Like, so we had a representative from Quezon City na hakatuwa naman. No, ganon ng ginagawa. Narinig yun din naman yung sa Tagig. Meron din. Ah, sorry, not Quezon City, but um, tama ba Quezon City? Manila yung isa pala Manila. Sorry. So that that's what we need to know. No, what are these uh, adjustments that we're making? And again, I focus on the long term. The long term. Now, what I'd like to know is do other resource persons have anything to say, add, to comment on uh, the, the presentations of other resource persons, of uh, practices that you're, you'd like to push for that you feel is not being done by both DepEd and CHED? I'd, I'd like to call on resource persons to react. Madam Chair. Yes. Chair. Yeah, uh, Aldrin from Ched. Uh, yes. If I if I may share to the body uh, the, the the things that uh, that are doing right now by Ched in line with this COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, we are now implementing flexible learning uh, program. Uh, this flexible learning is a design and delivery of programs, courses, and intervention that uh, will address the learner's unique needs in terms of uh, the four P's, no? So these are the these are place, space, process, and products of learning. So it means to say that uh, we are uh, addressing the individual needs of the students. So those students who are finding, finding it so hard to connect with the teacher, uh, those students who are uh, situated in the far-flung areas, those students who have very uh, good connectivity, so uh, in relation to this, Madam Chair, uh, we were able to uh, constitute a technical panel for this flexible learning. And we are now in the final stage of uh, these policy standards and guidelines on flexible learning. And then uh, we are also capacitating the faculty members as well as the students uh, at the regional level. So we were able to organize different consortiums in fact, uh, many regions are now uh, uh, implementing this, uh, even without the, the budget coming from the government. Uh, they are taking the initiative 
in order for them to jumpstart the implementation of a flexible learning program. So, uh, Madam Chair, the flexible learning will address uh, all the learning needs of the different types of students. Yeah, what I also wanted to emphasize, uh, Commissioner, and also for DepEd, no? um, I'm not sure who was the one who said it earlier, but I, I uh, wanted to emphasize that one of the resource persons said that it's not a matter of transferring to a digital platform the uh, materials in the textbook. I uh, Ma'am Casino, yeah. So I agree with that whole part. Because I actually, um, my team has actually helped me um, uh, shift to a more digital uh, and eco-friendly uh, way of uh, studying and preparing them for hearings. And um, it's been very effective because it actually also includes the use of a uh, digital pen. It's an Apple pen no, that allows me to write on it. And without that, kasi, I had I had a very hard time shifting because um, I'm just reading, you know, it, it becomes boring. But um, and that's just my own little experience there. So, uh, DepEd, can we, you know, can we be assured that hindi ganun ang nangyayari? Uh, has this been, is this actually something that has been discussed with the trainers, uh, made very clear, na it's just not, it's not, yun nga yung sinasabi ko, yun, na parang from, class, from Blackboard to computer, kung ganun lang mangyayari, uh, we're not maximizing this opportunity. In fact, it's probably gonna be worse because so that content was developed for a book type of flipping through it, but it doesn't work that way. Oh, oh. so can we get the information from DepEd? Uh, Ma'am, our specialists are uh, doing those uh, preparations uh, at the moment, and uh, 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 perhaps in the succeeding hearings, we'll be able to uh, uh, to illustrate uh, samples of how those learning materials are being uh, translated, and not in the way that you have described that uh, they're originally intended for classrooms, and then we just shifted it into. Uh, okay, thank you for that. Let me call on Senator Gachalian. Um, sure, when you have the floor. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me greet uh, Commissioner Derla, my Kababaya, uh, good afternoon. And let me also greet the other resource person. I was listening intently earlier at uh, marami po akong natutunan sa kanila. But among the government agencies, uh, the, the education-related agency agencies is probably the most capable of leaping frog or jumping to the 21st century and moving into online or di digitalization. Uh, among all the sectors, I think ed the education sector also can leapfrog into the 21st century uh, pedagogy. And this is because there's demand. And uh, I also listened from the resource person that, of course, access, uh, affordability is still the biggest issue. But um, the demand is there. And I agree with Dr. Uh, Cancino that um, pedagogy moving, pedagogy using online is also very important. Hindi lang in scan, you know, PDF that we upload, but the way we deliver education using internet and online platform is very important. And this is a, the, the best opportunity to move towards that direction. And um, even though uh, we see there's a big gap in terms of uh, affordability, but parents are willing to learn and invest. In fact, I read the, uh, the news article where in this Lola spent all of her savings to buy a smartphone for his um, Apo. This goes to show that will, parents and grandparents are willing to spend for technology. And um, I think DepEd and Chen should take notice of this and already start investing into digitalization. The new normal will be a mix of traditional and digital platforms. And this is really where government should invest heavily in the next few years. Um, I, I uh, share the sentiment of uh, the chair and also the other resource persons that uh, we need to do it uh, as soon as possible because um, uh, this is it. No? This is a new normal that we will be looking at in the next few years. 
So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gachalian. As I mentioned earlier, um, I'd like to coordinate with uh, your office for our next hearing, and maybe we can streamline the topics we want to take up. Um, uh, I'll work with you on that so that we can take advantage of our break and uh, do more, have more hearings when we have a little bit more time than when we're in session. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Madam Chair, if, Madam Chair that's yes, okay. well, I'll take off from your hearing also so we don't duplicate uh, uh, the topics yes. and we can build on topics on, on top of each other. And uh, of course, what we want is to uh, reform uh, the system and as well as adapt into the digital age. So we'll build on top of our hearing, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, um. I think uh, we're ready to wrap up our hearing for today. I will not. Um, I will just suspend it because uh, we want to invite more resource persons on this. Um, again, the, the focus really is the future of education. It is not my intention to, to tackle the day-to-day -day issues right now, but obviously we touch on it to help us prepare for that future. Um, I'm very happy that uh, the uh, department, uh, the Department of Education, has a future. Yes, uh, NEDA is also um, NEDA has also started with one, and so that's really the, the objective here, no? Um, to move ourselves into that future, to be discussing what we expect to see, and maybe we can uh, get some best practices um, in other countries on how they're already doing this. Uh, in in other hearings um, of this committee, we actually had international speakers join us and. Those are um, um, unexpected benefits of the times that we are living in. Na madali tayong makakuha ng mga international speakers din kasi everything is done by Zoom. We just have to look at the time difference. So um, let me thank all of you who were here. You're all invited to come back again, although our focus might shift a little bit. But I, I really appreciate all the input that you have given us. And Please uh, consider the Senate your partner in uh, improving the uh, the education system in our country. I'm, I'm really happy that Senator Gachalian is uh, online, uh, along with our other colleagues who were able to attend, Senator Marcos, Senator Tolentino. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll uh, end this um, hearing for today, suspended lang for until future notice. It might be on Thursday or Friday or next Monday. I just have to holiday ang... Holiday pala ang Friday. June 12, sorry, I didn't realize that. I, I didn't even realize June na nga pala ngayon. Okay, so hindi pala mangyayari ang Friday. So possible is Thursday, but I'll have to release the invitation by later on. So I will have a quick discussion with my staff. Most likely to be next week. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay safe and have a good afternoon.